Okay. So, so, but there are, so of course I can look at something in nature, something dynamical in nature and try to learn dynamical roots from them. Okay. That is what scientists have been doing for ages. These days, of course, uh, we simulate a lot, right? And you might think, okay, if you're simulating, you know the roots, right? But you might actually like to know, even out of a simulation, if you see some dynamics, are there some simpler roots, right? So for example, if you simulate a lot of particles banging into each other, you know all the roots for how the particles evolve. But you might see that in long time, what you can predict is how the density becomes constant around the place. So there could be collective variables, which you want to, which has much simpler roots, and you might want to learn that kind of root. So you, and as I already put out, in this example, it's related to the second point, which is that there could be these kind of variables which have greater predictability and simpler roots that you might want to discover, like collective coordinates in the system, right? Okay, and the last bit is more engineering than science, but scientists use it all the time. You might not only want to, want to um, learn the rules, you might want to manipulate systems with the rule, you want, most probably want to move a robot through something or, or have a quantum system be put into a certain state starting from another, okay? So you want to control it. And in many cases of controlling the system, especially when data acquisition has delays or it is noisy or it is rare, you might actually do well to learn some approximate model of the system. Okay, so that you can manipulate the system accordingly. So these are some of the major reasons why we want data driven models, um, simpler models out of out of data, out of out of dynamic data. Okay. So, so I'll try to do this talk in three parts. And so the first part is sort of a probabilistic formulation of the problem. That's what like from the 60s, 70s. 80s. Okay. Then I will go to part two, which is what we have gotten very excited about or ability to use feed forward neural networks. I understand that yesterday you had a lecture and tutorial on deep nets, right? So you're familiar. I mean, it's very hard not to be familiar with it, even if you don't practice anything, newspapers are screaming about it. Okay, so uh, and how can you use that, right? And uh, again, very overview level. And the last bit I want to say is something about how tapping into a high dimensional space, right? Sometimes simplify things, right? And that is to do with dynamic mode decomposition. So let's see how we go through it. At the end of each part, I will stop and I'll invite some questions. I know it's difficult to extract a question from someone who's thinking I don't understand, right? But please, most of the time, I'm not very sure what is on there, okay? I have confusions. So you should have confusions too, okay? Okay, so the problems you want to talk about sort of time series, time series with Markov models, latent variables, state estimation, learning the thing, and uh, systems neuroscience application that actually involves Yavash there. Okay. I have to definitely pay my homage to him. <laughs> and if Dominic was getting upset, the next two examples would be about the work I, I was lucky to do with him. Okay. Fine. Okay. So, time series data. So, I'm going to call our observations Y. Okay. Now, most of the time when physicists are seeing something like fluid flow or, or measuring some, or observing some, uh, I don't know, smoke move through something, right? They have some high dimensional vector representing the state, okay? Or at least their observation. They have lots of sensors measuring something. So you think of this Y1 colon T as a bunch of vectors, each of them, let's say N dimensional, okay? Now, many of these methods actually doesn't require a vector with numerical entries, 
Okay, y could be a categorical variable. In fact, some of the most useful applications of the methods I'll talk are to DNA sequence data or to languages. Okay, but um, you, I'll, I'll pretend these are numbers, and it turns out that in many of those problems, sometimes it helps, especially modern day natural language processing problems. It helps to convert words into vectors too. Okay, so in some ways, uh, thinking about of these things as numbers and not as discrete stuff, okay? It's not such a bad thing, okay? So I have a bunch of vectors, okay? I call it capital T. And I'll keep on changing notation because if I need a transpose, the T will be taken, et cetera. But right now, one to T. So it's a time series, right? Okay? And I can say, oh, I'll make a probabilistic model of this data, okay? This is, ah, oh, is there a way of sort of pointing? Oh, maybe I should point here. Yeah, right. Can you, can you guys see my cursor? You guys can, right? Okay. So here is the joint probability distribution of all these Ys. Okay. And the point is that because of the beauty of how you can always do conditional probability, you can always write this as probability of Y one, then probability of y2 given y1, probability of y3 given y1 and y2, okay? All the way till the end, right? And, okay, if I ever try to write down something like a dependency graph, it will be y2 will depend only on y1. y1 is the beginning of everything, right? It has a probability distribution, the marginal probability distribution. And as you go further, more and more things from behind keep on affecting it, right? So on one hand, you look at it, so, oh, so cool. I can always write future as a function of past, right? But the trouble is that it is so general, it's almost useless, okay? You can actually do it backwards in time, okay? The fact that you have this many parameters to learn it's like learning the most general probability distribution, okay? And that we know by seeing just one data point, one time series or a small number of time series examples, it's pretty hard to learn, okay? And if you're getting a hang of how this school goes, you'll most probably sense that what one is trying to say, that we can do machine learning when there is some structure in the data. If you give me random data, I can't predict or make any sense out of it. I mean, my algorithms can produce an output, okay? But that's about as much as that's garbage, right? So we often try to say, I assume this problem has some structure, okay? So one kind of structure you can say is that the yt depends on no more than k previous. Fixed, right? So easiest would be if it was one, right? Uh, so this would be some k order Markov model. Okay? Future y gets predicted by the string of y's before, but it doesn't go all the way to the past. And you have most probably seen examples of it in terms of like autoregressive models. Okay? Where yt is a linear combination of yt minus one up to yt minus k plus some noise. Okay, that kind of time series fitting is the basis of lots of if immediately somebody wants to project, I don't know, stock market, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the first idiotic thing you might do, right? Um, okay, so that's one way, okay? Try to remember the effect of past through only a short window, okay? A limited window of past, right? But there is sort of an alternative the alternative is, it, so this is, again, if you have seen it, okay, how many of you have actually, maybe it's time for me to break your silence. How many of you know about hidden Markov models? Okay, so, okay, so you guys, okay, if you, unless you see me saying something grossly wrong, okay, we'll keep your cool, okay? Mm -hmm. And I want the guys who have not seen the Unmarker model before to ask me questions and see get something out of it. 
Okay, I, I'm sure that's quite a possibility that there will be something grossly wrong. But then please correct me because otherwise I'll fall down. But okay. So in the hidden Markov model latent variable, the idea is the following. Okay, there are some secret variables in the world. Okay, and those secret variables determine what we observe probabilistically. Okay, right? So, and essentially what we want to know is to get to these secret variables. They're a little bit like our collective variables in physics, right? We want to say, I see a lot of things, but actually just because it's ferromagnetic and there's a magnetization under that. Right now, um, in 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 uh, I kept on I said something about stock market. It was the stock market close by, but anyway, uh, even if it, if you want to know about the economy, you might find some sort of data. I don't know employment here, okay, general income level somewhere else, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The real wheels under it, maybe new technology innovation, maybe some sort of recession versus. Okay, it's on the bull or bear market dynamics, which we don't get access to. Nobody tells us we are in this type of market, right? Of course, everybody tells us, but different people say different things. Okay, so there could be some sort of underlying macroeconomic dynamics that's going on, right? And what you're observing are some indicators out of it. So it, it makes sense to say there is a fundamental model. What we observe is some sort of stochastic function of it, right? And our job is to sneak back from this stochastic function, from these observations into these secret variables. Okay. Another way of thinking about it is that if I, so, so the way this model works, I have written down equations by ignore equations. Uh, somebody tell me if Jack has anything screaming something at me. So this is a hidden Markov model because these hidden variables they have probabilistic rules of transition, right? Okay. And these hidden variables kind of emit these observations. Okay. Right. So you should think that way. You should think when we have some data, okay, these Ys are pinned down. Okay. I've seen this. I've seen this. I've seen this. But I don't know the secret underlying thing. There's a whole probability distribution of them. They could still wiggle. Some with high probability, some with low probability. If I had a Monte Carlo way of doing things, I could have sampled it, right? Right. And in that view, right? So, so okay. So this type of model, okay, is a very useful. I one of the reasons it was quite popular in some time and even now to some extent is that when people wanted to do speech recognition, people used to use hidden Markov models where Essentially, the sounds I'm making from waveform, you could figure out some features. And these features were, you can see the feature, right? But secretly, I'm trying to produce some phonemes. And then there is some transition structure of these phonemes, right? So a hidden Markov model could capture that and perhaps do word recognition with something on top of it. Okay, yeah. Um, maybe that's a very general question, but what's the general definition of the Markov model? Okay, so I am being a physicist. I want to say everything is a hidden Markov model, but okay, let let's let's give a definition to that yeah, and satisfy you. Yeah, you can write on the wall. You think. I I'm I'm told right, but so I I I am very nervous about writing on the wall, but I was given a demo. Okay, so I'll do this. But okay, so look here. There is a space on which HS live. In the traditional HMM world, that's a discrete space. Okay, but it doesn't have to be. I'll soon talk about places where the H space is continuous. Okay, there is an initial probability distribution of this H, and then there are transition rules. Right, so it's a Markov evolution process of this Hs. Once I tell you how H evolves to H prime with what probability. Okay. So, it, so a Markov model always has to have a probability of how it transitions, or what's Fundamental. Oh, so the, oh, the, so yeah, okay, so okay, that was it, fine. So I have then probability of H T plus one. I'm I called it T because transition T is taken. I'm told these roots. 
right? So let me give you, okay. So my favorite example in my HM introduction is that you are in some medieval marketplace and then there is a charlatan there who's giving you odds with a coin, but has, a, has an unbiased coin and a biased coin, okay? And he's giving you odds of like five heads or something or other and nobody knows probability theory. So they are taking bets and you want to catch them, okay? When he's using the bias coin, but you can only see heads and tails. So he has some random rules by which he moves from one to the other. So these are his transitions between the biased and the unbiased coin, okay? So if I just know that model, I can simulate what kind of biased and unbiased coin trajectories would happen. And then, as a result of these trajectories, there would be probabilities of seeing heads or tails. Your job is to watch heads or tails and make guesses about whether he's using a biased coin now or an unbiased coin now. Okay. So that's the underlying reality we are trying to get at. So, so just like this is given, this is the transition probabilities, the emission probabilities, which is what you observe, like heads and tails. Even the hidden state biased or unbiased coin is also given to you, right? And then you 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 try to make probabilistic guesses about it. You could do many different things if you're just going on and at a certain point you say, "I've seen so much in the past. What do you think the age is?" That's like um, sort of filtering problem. If you look at the whole thing, see the future, you have more information. That's more like a smoothing kind of problem. Right, so there are lots of things you can do, okay, probabilistically, okay. But the key thing I want to, so, okay. So I was giving this example of a crazy one. Um, it has been used in non-dynamic thing, but, but for example, when people sequence a genome, you think of going along the genome and seeing the ACGT as if you're seeing something in time, okay? And then there are hidden marker models that will tell you, is this region, there's a G, is there some like coding region here? Is this an intron or an exon? So it's it's very, very useful there. But the, I will touch upon something else which has something to do with control, okay? Which is a linear Gaussian dynamical system, which is kind of fundamental to, uh, for I don't know how many of you are physicists. Okay, so physicists have to say, okay, this is the harmonic oscillator or something. Okay, so this is a harmonic oscillator of control theory. Okay, where what you have is that you say, oh, the, the dynamical system essentially is linear. Oh, by the way, I should erase it. Oh, it's from, it doesn't get it. okay. No, I think I'll take care of it. Okay, time. fine, fine, fine. I should not spend my time cleaning my. Right, so there is there is this absolutely linear dynamics. Xt, by the way, Xt is the common notation. That was my Ht, okay? Xt is continuous, okay? Xt, Xt plus one is A times Xt. I mean, actually, if I had a harmonic oscillator and I discretize it, right? Then Xt would have been the position and the momentum, two components of it. And if I take a little time, I can actually predict what would happen to the position and momentum a step, time step later, right? So that would be my harmonic oscillator there. If it is dissipative, if it is dying, there would be some decay, okay? Right? B times U is basically you're trying to mark with that harmonic oscillator, okay? So U is an effort, like you put additional forces. So again, People's favorite example is that think of a linearized inverted pendulum. Okay. This guy is trying to run away from its position zero. Okay. If I linearize it, my job is to put additional forces, which I or torques, by, which I can do by wiggling at the bottom, right? And trying to keep it straight. So think of like a stick with heavy ball on top of it and you're trying to balance it. So I apply additional forces. So B use that term. Vt is extra noise, okay? And here comes the observation. Yt is some linear function of xt, would be even lower dimensional than, or higher dimensional than xt. And wt is some kind of noise whose covariance is unknown. Now, there is sort of an additional task 
of minimizing some other objective function. Like I want to keep x t square small. Okay. I don't want to spend too much energy doing it, but we are not going to focus on this. Thing we are going to focus on is that if you are given a system and you are trying to play with it, okay, you need to a know what these parameters a, b, c, etc. are, okay. Perhaps what the covariance of noise is, okay. If you absolutely must, okay. And also you have to solve the other problem, okay, which is that I only see y t. Maybe I only see position. I don't do velocity measurements, right? But to, dynamic predict, to dynamically predict something, I need to know both positions and velocities. What can I do? Right. So I so okay. So that sort of so part of these two problems, knowing this problem, I'll call it systems identification. The other one I'll call state estimation. But those are fancy words for figuring out ABC and guessing X from 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 the uh, knowledge of y and use use you applied so you know okay okay so that's what we'll do now so so this is actually is like the previous model it's just that the h which is x now is continuous okay and everything is gaussian okay so okay um, so the key key thing i want you to remember here which is not too much math, okay, is that you can iteratively get to know what your distribution of a posterior distribution of ht plus one would be, okay, given all the observations. And that's an exercise in just Bayesian algebra, okay. The way you can think about it is that if I saw y1 to y little t, I have some posterior on ht. Right, and I update it by saying that by by some formula that says, oh, I've seen a new piece of data. Okay, if I did not see it, then all I could do is to use my transition matrix to guess what the new probability should be. But knowing the yt changes this balance. Okay, and I think some. So, for example, in my charlatan in the in the in the market, if he has a run of ten heads, okay, and he's winning like hell, possibly you know something is wrong, and one more head actually increases your suspicion that he's using the bias card. Okay, okay, so that's all. That's the most important thing. Rest of the algebra you can work out. The other comment I want to make is that um, in the linear quadratic case. Again, I'll, I'll, the U will hang there, but exactly how to choose U is another topic. I'm not going to touch it, okay? It turns out that in that case, all these posterior distributions are Gaussian. So if I knew something about their means and variances and could figure out how the mean and variance evolves as opposed to like the full, that's equivalent to knowing how the full distribution evolves. So, if I could just summarize, think of the posterior di distribution and seeing a new piece of data, how the posterior distribution evolves, okay? And for the linear Gaussian case, it's very, very pretty. In, uh, sorry, you can actually do it by something called Kalman filter, okay? And uh, you don't fully have to absorb it, but it's sort of cool enough that I want you to get a hang of it. Okay, so the idea is this. Okay, look, look at this x hat. So what are so these are Gaussian distributions. So the posterior has a mean position somewhere it is peaked. Okay, and it has some covariance around it, right? And it will be nice to know the evolution equation. Okay, from t to t plus one of what would happen to the mean and what would happen to the covariance. I'm going to ignore the covariance for the time being, although. There are people actually have to do that if they do traditional control theory. Okay, look at the mean. Okay, look at look at this equation. X hat t plus one is a x hat plus b u. Okay, that's the average we expect based on our previous averages knowledge and given the dynamics. Then 
comes the correction due to new piece of same data, seeing data, right? So if this was exactly YT, I should say I have predicted perfectly I'm taking a vacation, right? But what if your observation, YT plus one, did not quite turn out to be what you expected in average. It turned out a little bit higher or lower in some other direction, right? You need to correct. Remember we said when we see a bit of data, okay, we should alter our expectation, not just go with what we project, not knowing any extra piece of data. And that correction could be captured. So this ET, this mismatch between observed data and my average prediction. There is some, so this is a vector, okay? And there is some matrix sitting there that tells you how that corrects it, okay? So everything is linear. Everything is a linear combination of X hat, UT, and YT because it's all Gaussian, right? The new mean is going to be linear combinations of these things, okay? And, but this way of saying, when I miss, if I predict things wrong, I correct my thing, is a very, very worthwhile way of formulating this thing, okay? And this would be important in a little bit of the thing I'm going to talk about, okay? Okay, so there is like, this is a whole subject, but I'm, I'm just going to spend three sentences and move on. Okay, how do you know the equivalence of ABC? Yes, please. Can I ask you about the previous one? Previous one, yes. How do you actually produce E at the next iterate? Or okay. is the goal so, to minimize so, it? So the way you would do, if I do nightly, I have my X hat T, and I've applied some control in T, like my, I saw my pendulum, inverted pendulum is here, and I put a push, right? So I can calculate according to my model, if I knew A and B, where on the average I wanted to land up. That is A hat T, A X hat T, this thing, and B U T. What is my average observation for that? Okay, C times that, right? For example, if this combination had both the position and the momentum as top and bottom component of a vector, I'm just watching the top. Say I'm only observing position, right? Okay, but where is the position now? I look, I see it is away from there. So I take the difference. This is cut off the innovation. This is the part that I'm surprised by. I'm, I'm going to call it the surprise variable, okay? My experiment <laughs> says my theory may be wrong, okay? And I say, oh, oh, it is too much to the left. Let me go correct my new x t plus one, okay? Hmm. Right. Okay. So I theoretically, I said it was going to go there. I see it's there. I said, now I really need to work because I think it's too far off. Okay, maybe need even bigger force to bring it back, hmm. okay? Okay. So turns out that LTs are functions of all these ABs and other parameters, but it's a very, it's a pain if you don't know them, right? To learn these parameters, okay, there is something called expectation maximization. I'm not going to get into it. You will figure, you must probably heard of it, please read up. Of course, you can take log likelihood and just do gradient descent. Okay, in parameters, everything is done by gradients this day, so not a bad thing. If you are super Bayesian, you can set up some priors on these things and do MCMC. There are all kinds of ways of going over this parameter space. It's not as bad as it looks. Okay. So, okay. Now, so, so one way is to really learn ABC and the covariances and compute this L parameter. Now, it turns out that if I have a more or less stationary system, right? My things have kind of settled down, this L becomes kind of independent of T, right? And we can do something crazy. We can say, hey, I'm going to find this ABL parameter by doing this following. I don't have, want to have not too much surprise. I say norm of E square, right? Sum should be minimized by marking with A, right? This is an approximate way of going about it, but it actually does operate pretty well. Okay, so there I'd say I did not know any control theory. I'm just going to train my networks or train my various functions in this thing in a way so that this, this surprise strength is minimized, yes. Why is the L independent of time? Okay, so this one I would take off. So, so what happens is that, so 
I could actually start with the inverted harmonic oscillator, which is a very unstable system, nothing stationary about it. But if I put an appropriate feedback on it, the system would be stabilized. So yes, like after a long time. After a little bit of time, things would settle down to some routine and the optimal L would actually settle down to something. Optimal L is function of all kinds of things, including covariances and other things. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, yeah, covariances of some noise and covariance of this estimate, they all kind of converge to something. Okay. If, the, if the environment changes, you have to change and start again. Right? Okay. Okay. So I'm actually now going to jump for this. So, so we applied, part of this was useful in thinking about some problem. There you see, see much. Okay, about something about sensory motor uh, system in the brain, right? And well, as you can imagine, people moving around playing tennis, for example, okay, is trying to learn about the world. And in some sense, you cannot quite play tennis this way. I just swing the racket, okay? And if I hit, okay, and the ball goes and get a point, only then I respond. Right? It, it will take a long time if you just blindly try out all kinds of shots and see what happens. Right? When you see the ball coming at you, I don't know how many of your tennis sport works. Right? If you haven't already have a mental picture of its trajectory, right? You most probably can't play because with the latencies, okay, you need to know where it is, way before it is there. Right? So when we become better at it or figure out a particular environment, I'm sure the top players figured out that okay, today court is hot and things are moving faster and right, and another day is different. That little adjustments actually come from building an internal model. And most of us would not be anywhere because the data that comes to us comes late, comes with noise, comes poorly. Okay. So so um, so anyway, so in sensory motor control, presumably building a, an internal model is important. And what we wanted to do there is rather than just have a normative description or just starting to talk about brain, talk about how we can have learning in which, in which we can kind of say, okay, brain could learn this because synaptic plasticity rules of brain require information from the neighborhood. And okay, so I would actually almost skip over the rest and say, we could do it, okay, right? Uh, so this half of the top is of the picture is about control, but that half is about Kalman filtering and way of learning, even for this linear problem, learning Kalman filtering in a biologically plausible network, okay? So, okay, so maybe it has some use, we can say, oh, look, here is a system with delays in which it, if the delay increases, it takes longer time to learn, but it still learns, right? And we can also mimic some of the strange experiments that people do where they say, oh, try to move this, this hold this device, move it here. And then they suddenly turn on a crazy feed, effectively, where if you try to go this, you get pushed sideways, okay? And pathetic people then start, like instead of making straight row for it, make this very bent out things. But with time, okay, they they learn to compensate for it. Okay, and well, in human experiments, things kind of improve over time, right? They figure out those roots. Okay, and okay, uh, well, if our network did not do it, we will not quite publish this paper. Okay. Anyway, so so here is the first break point, and I have eaten up like yeah quite a bit of time. So is there a question that for the first part? And again, I'm not obliged to finish according to. Okay, well, but of course you could say that now you can go, but okay, but that's most probably not in the books. Yeah. Can you explain like? What do you mean by biologically inspired? Okay, so the thing is that if you just take some objective function like likelihood and you say, oh, I 
take a gradient with respect to this parameter, and I will say that these parameters would change like this, right? So what would happen is that, of course, who are these parameters in our brain? Presumably synaptic strengths. Now imagine you say the synaptic strength improves by this neuron whose synapsis is its activity and 13 other neurons which are very far away. We're not, we're not talking to this. That doesn't seem like um, Hebbian or any kind of even non-Hebbian biological rule. So all the machine learning gradient rules you get, not all of them are easily implementable in terms of what we understand about synaptic plasticity today. Now, this is a bit of a dangerous game because biology, you often say this biology cannot do, and you find then some crazy way biology does that just to spite you, okay? But if we say today we understand how the brain does plasticity, okay, how, how synaptic plasticity happens, if I want to make it consistent, you need some tweaking. So that's what one is trying to do. One trying to find rules for learning the dynamics, et cetera, where we don't have to make unreasonable rules about, about uh, synaptic updates. So this one actually satisfies more or less reasonable things. Okay, okay. so fine. Part two, okay, part two. Okay, so as I said, I will try to make however tenuous possible efforts of connecting things. There are many discussions of neural net based looping ways of looking at dynamics, where you can start from scratch, say neural nets and just move. But I'll sort of try to make some connection to what I said in the past. And hopefully uh, if you hear of parallel methods or something, you can kind of try to say, oh, A should correspond to B, okay? So I'll talk about uh, recurrent neural networks. I'll talk about a particular kind of thing, which is kind of like the neural, recurrent neural network, a very special one called neural OD. Okay. Uh, that's because we did something with it. Okay. And we'll talk about an application to quantum many body theory. That's something that uh, Domenico was working on. Was nice enough to call me. Okay. So I am not going to spend much time on this, but you have heard enough about feed forward neural networks. The way to broadly, we just need it here is to say, people think of them as some sort of universal function approximators. Okay. I'm not too fond of that, but let's say, yes, anytime there's a function to be approximated, why not try a neural network? And then the function is characterized, okay, by the weights in this uh, humongousness, okay. And as you know, um, as you know, these days the neural networks have more parameters than most probably data points, right? People used to be afraid of it in ancient times; they now no, no longer are. There is some degree of justification given why we shouldn't be afraid, but not a clean one yet, okay. But that's the status. Okay, if you could train a neural net to approximate a function, we can maybe go. Okay, so remember I said that in Kalman filter or something, we are thinking of a Gaussian distribution evolving. Okay, and then there was a mean and then there was a covariance and I said, I'll forget the covariance. Okay, now you cannot really forget the covariance there, but I kind of found a work, work around it because I could use the L directly from learning from data. But what if we could be like that? What if we say, we are going to be crazy and make this approximation that this posterior distribution is all concentrated at one point, okay? Well, then it is nothing other than a deterministic function, right? That is, you tell me the past yt, okay? And the past ht and the new data piece, and I'll be able to tell you what actually maybe I should have said yt plus one, okay? No, but you get the idea. I know the past state, okay, deterministically rather than a probability distribution. So could be the mean, could be the mode, could be something. And I give, give me a new piece of data, I'll tell you what the new, new guy is, okay? So, 
So this is often drawn. YT and HT together determine what the new HT plus one is. Okay. These arrows, by the way, are very, these are the arrows in which the neural network is working. Previously, the arrows went the other way, right? From HT to YT, right? Those are the generate the diagram of the generative model. Okay. So here it will get reversed a bit and go to the wrong guy. Okay. But this is how we'll think about it. Right, so this, these, so there is a dynamical rule. The dynamical rule is affected by YT. HT is like some secret latent space, again, right, which captures all the information about the past. So that going forward, we don't, don't need, okay, to know all the Y before that, okay? And by the way, this is this this is a tension that has not completely gone away. I started out in the probabilistic part saying, oh, I have the whole train of Ys, right? And tell me something about the future. And in theory, all of past could affect, right? Then I could say, no, 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 only past beyond K affects you. And then I said, no, 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 it's even better to say there is some secrets rather than put an artificial time limit. I capture it in terms of some, either call it hidden state, call latent variables in terms of it. All of past is captured in terms of the knowledge of a probability distribution of those HTs, okay, right? So it turns out that RNNs, neural networks are taking that point of view, okay? All of past is summarized in the current HT, right? And there would be other set of approaches Right, especially the current day favorite of attention or uh, based sort of transformer networks, which says, no, 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 give me the whole input thing. I will figure out what's relevant. And in language models, this is actually an issue because as you know, if I want to translate some piece of language, something very early, a context saying this is happening in a courtroom, okay? Most probably changes meanings of lots of things. And you need ways to remember that. And you can do it either by having some degrees of freedom in your latent space that remembers things for long, or you have to have some way of saying that if I see this kind of thing now, word now, maybe I should go check, okay? 20 words behind, whether something was said that said it was in a reward bank or a, or a financial institution, okay? Right, okay. So that, that is true, but, but okay, we are taking the RNN look, well, it's recurrent because it looks like the neural net has neurons that are interacting with each other. Feed forward networks kind of don't do that. Okay, so there are models where I have this white is coming and some O bar T's go out, which are sort of predictions for observations. So for example, I could have a sentence running in, in the language context and I could say, okay, what's the current sentiment or topic? Okay. Or if you are really, really brave, you could say this is an English sentence, <laughs> sort of throw out the French translation of it. Okay. That usually dies in the simplest thing. Okay. You have to do more. Right? And then you can check with some training data of what the observations are and see whether the OBARs predicted a LIPO. Right. So that's what would happen, sort of a sequence to sequence RNN. Right. Those would depend upon the secret variables, right? And we can actually consider a special case where I'm really predicting future Ys that are coming, right? And I can just see whether these Ys are produced correctly, right? That's a simpler case. I want to just self-predict, right? Based on past, okay? Right, so um, as I, I already commented on it, you will hear things about things with uh, GRUs, LSTMs, et cetera. These are granular RNN forgets things from the past, okay? Because it has limited space to remember it in its age variable, right? So they kind of work very hard to make special components that remember a lot, right? But you could also use some other approach like attention mechanisms, which figured out whether we should go back and look at something else, okay. But this is something where maybe other people know a lot more than that, and I'm basically trying to avoid talking about it. Okay, so here I come to something that is closer to this stuff. A uh, lot of things in 
in physics, right, are essentially differential equations, right? A lot of not quite physics, even outside physics, right? Dynamical models, like we have both ordinary or partial differential equations. You can think of partial differential equations as ordinary differential equation in functions, right? So again, I have some, now quite often what I might want to do is to ask, is there an approximation to this dynamics or a way of describing this dynamics in terms of some simpler variables, okay? So I've tried to do the same thing here in a continuous version. Right, I have y's, which I observe. I want to convert it in by some encoder function to, oh, by the way, one of the things I wanted to say there is that these f's and g's, right, which are functions I have to learn. You can, you can use the parameterization of feed forward networks, the multi-layer perceptrons, okay? And then train the w's to load the loss, okay? So here also, I have these three functions. One is what that converts my observed y's into some hidden variables, okay? The second function that tells you how the hidden variable evolves in under a differential equation. So h dot is some function of k. And y bar t is the decoder that says, given the hidden variable, what do I think the y variable is? So I have these three unknown functions from high dimensional space to reasonably high, maybe lower dimensional space, but not quite scalars, okay? And then we can say, oh, I know from some either observing dynamics or from some simulation, yt is what I see, right? And y bar t is what I predict. I have some loss function, maybe this minus that square. I might say, I want to see over the whole path is low. I might say, I want to see at the end it is low. So I can weigh differently, different times, okay? And based on that, I could say, well, can I find the best E, K, and D? And once more, E, K, and D could be parameterized as this sort of heat or neural network. And you can train its, its parameters, okay? To find the one that will minimize the loss, okay? So, okay, yeah. Uh, so as you wrote here, the encoder is only on the initial conditions. Or... You actually can see, you can, if you have the encoder, you can also use it halfway through because I still know why, right? And you can sort of convert it into the corresponding H and run and credit. Now, so think of the zero shifted, oh, okay. right? So yeah, the thing we did is closer to closer to doing it at the beginning. And also we did a cheeky version of it. But uh, but yeah, in, in principle, it, it should work everywhere. Like, yeah, you should, it should be able to do it. Right, right. So exactly how do you set up the loss function? You could actually have different starting and finish points. And also you have to have some kind of weight for different amount of prediction, right? How, how do you value that? Right, yeah. Yeah, definitely a worth, worthwhile modification, okay. So, okay, so the application of this, I'm going to do to something quite weird and maybe even takes up too much time to explain, okay. So it's the application we're thinking about is not, okay, traditional dynamics, but something called renormalization group, okay. And what is renormalization group? It's this idea that, if we go to different scales, right? We have different effective Hamiltonians or different effective dynamical rules. So I, again, keep on going back to my example of describing particles bumping into each other to overall um, diffusion of the density, okay? Or of momentum, right? We have this coarse grain, long range descriptions, right? And the point is that as we, go from small distances to large distances, we can rescale it and make, try to make it look the same, right? But as we do that, our dynamical rules change, okay? So there is basically a whole new set of dynamical rules or Hamiltonians, et cetera, that has to be written down at each level. And they're related to the previous levels, 
previous scales dynamical rules. So this is actually made successful only in very particular setting, but this was a revolutionizing thing, as many of you know, in 70s and 80s, that has kind of changed how particle theorists and condensed matter theorists at least look at the world. Okay. And these are some of the heroes of that development. Ken Wilson is the one who got Nobel Prize. I guess most of them are long now. Michael Fisher passed away shortly. Anyway, but the interesting thing is that what especially is Ken Wilson's contribution here is that you should think of an infinite dimensional space of Hamiltonians. Okay? Many, many dimensions there are actually not going to matter. Right? Many details are not going to matter, but a few details are going to be important as you go to the long distance thing, right? So again, I could have many different rules for the potential among the balls that are bouncing with each other, but overall density profile would be determined by one thing, that is the effective diffusion constant, right? So at the end, what matters are very few things out of this huge number of parameters, okay? And that seems like what we are talking about, except in scale space rather than in time. Okay, so here was an example that is a, a, a project in CCQ. So here you can see Bonomico. Okay, and this has to do with something called Hubbard model. Okay, so which is a model for, for interacting electrons. In this case, the, the Fermi surface, in this case, the Fermi curve, maybe. Okay, is like this, not very, very round looking, right? And there are points around it, which is a momentum at which electron can, electrons or holes can be found, okay? And there is the, there is a scattering strength. If electrons come with K1, K2, when they scatter out to K3, K4, what's the amplitude of that, okay? And it's a function, if we have momentum conservation, it's a function of K1, K2, K3. Okay, and as if you discretize points around K okay, here, what is 48 points, right? Right, essentially it's a function of three variables, each have 48 values. So superficially there are 48 cube numbers with symmetries a little less maybe, but it's still a huge number of variables. So it is looking very much like the previous picture, very high dimensional characterization of Hamiltonian, but the point is that as we coarse grain it, okay, as we go to longer and longer scales and try to see what the effective interaction is, is this something that's going to become lower dimensional in some sense? Okay. And how can I figure it out? Now, most of the time physicists say intuitively, I think this is the most important channel. Write down a one parameter thingy and we get there. Right. Now, this model turns out to have a reasonably rich. Uh, physics and it does different things at different times. Okay. Now I have a bit of an issue here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, right. So, so the point is that as there's a parameter called T prime at that, that cranked up, it goes through different types of behavior, yes. Sorry, I didn't get what K1, K2, et cetera are. Right, so basically these are fermions, right? So I start out by quantizing in a box, the wave-like function. So there are single particle states, which are like E to the I, K, X. K is go over some grid, okay? If I keep the box finite, right? These are all single particle states. Now, if I had no interactions, I'll fill up the Fermi C, right, up to some threshold, okay? And, and essentially, at low temperatures, I'll have electrons go to energies close to that Fermi energy from below to above, so I get holes and, and particles, okay, close to that. Now I make this thing interacting, and now I can say, ah, oh, if from this pharmacy, I wake up two electrons, a little bit with higher energy, and then say, go at each other. And I say, oh, there is a Hubbard interaction between them. Okay, there's a four fermion term now. 
with two fermions going scattering against each other. And you say, what is that function like? In the raw Hamiltonian, that looks like a constant because it's like a delta function. Okay. But you say, oh, if I coarse grain sum and look at case, what does it look like? It keeps on changing. And it changes to very different things in different ranges of parameters. Suggesting in some cases, maybe there's an antiferromagnet, in some cases, maybe the superconductivity developing, some other case experiment. Okay. And these various pictures are slices from those different types of behavior that arises by coarse graining. Okay. Roughly the same vertex. Okay. With some parameters being different. Okay, in the in the other parts, right? And, look, and here we have the network pretty much like what I suggested. Except one, one cheaty thing is that since in the beginning life is simple, right? We have an encoder from a pretty low dimensional space. And but that z can be run through a differential equation we learn, and we can spit out what the v's would be, and we can do the painful work of numerically coarse graining and figuring out what the V is, and we train on that data. And the network we create can reproduce, okay, this complicated vertex function, okay, and at, uh, without having seen it before as part of training. Okay, anyway, so we are 25 minutes away from end, okay? So, so there's the third part. Well, but I'm sure I've said enough things that are confusing. So are there some questions? Yeah. For the neural mesh barrier, yeah. how do you find, uh, like you had a K, a right. neural, a K neural network, but yeah. how do you describe the dynamics? Is it just the K? Or you were so the dynamics are determined by K, but K also, as you can imagine, is a function parameterized by lots of lots of weights and a neural network. So those W's have to be updated to, to learn that appropriately, as we have to do for the, the, the E and the G. So all three of these functions are being trained at the same time. Yeah. And when, when, where does that go? OK, OK. So in the, in the picture or in the, in NOU, I most probably went too fast on it. OK? So, so uh, see here. So, if uh, in general you're asking, or in this particular context, in general. in general. So, okay, I'll even give you the particular context, even if you did not ask for it. Okay. So the y, right? It's like my vertex function. In principle, okay, um, forty-eight cube, which is more than, I guess, hundred thousand, one twenty. Uh, I can't do this, okay? Very large number of things, but it might have started as all constant, okay? There is some encoding that will make it into, say, an H, which is, say, 32 dimensional. I've chosen 32, we've tried many other dimensions. I will show you results with 32, okay? Then I try to train the network that says these 32 variables, how do they evolve in time? And then there is another function that says, given this 32 variable I'll produce for you, okay, the, I don't know, 48 cube numbers. Okay, so that's how, that's how the thing goes. Okay, and, and basically you can kind of see the reason we are succeeding is that these 48 cube numbers are not crazy. They have structure. They have a general background. There are places they are bright. There is actually a lower dimensional structure to learn. And the lower dimensional structure is different in different regimes. So the neural network has to be clever enough to pick up, okay, what to do differently at different places. Okay. And it just that it somehow manages. Right? Okay. Any other question? I think related to the yeah. answer. Understand correctly, the, the assumption is that the overlying dynamics are actually uh, dominated by dynamics on some lower, uh, some latent variables on lower dimensional space. Yes. So, uh, is there like a smart way to choose the, the code mixer? Like, how big? 
you want to tell me you know honestly? Yeah. No. No, I, I'm asking. No, 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 no. In in this game, basically, you try A, try B, try C. Also, oh, just like cross okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. So uh, one of the great things about neural nets is that it is let us be dumb. Okay. <laughs> Which is actually not let us be sort of some some poor person who is doing this. So usually the professor declares victory, and there are several dead graduate students and several others who have succeeded, right, in finding the right hyperparameters. Okay, who sort of said, okay, now it works, and everybody is sort of right. So it's a sad state of affairs. I wish there was something more intelligent, but as far as I know, no. Uh, but you have to be, of course, careful that in that process of searching, okay, have you actually fit both your test and train data set, train and test data set well enough and declared victory? Because I think we're coming to a point where you are risking that, right? If you search high in sort of large enough architecture space, you will find something that leads to success. Yeah, so it's a bit dangerous. So you have to sort of, so one of the things I'm not talking about is that we spend a lot of time afterwards asking how did it succeed? Because we don't kind of believe that it should succeed that easily. So what we found is that actually there were neurons which are roughly tracking what kind of phases. There are a collection of neurons who together were sort of coding what kind of phase the system is in. And having that regularity, which I'm not showing, that some partial interpretability made us feel a little bit more comfortable that this is maybe okay, right? In theory, then you could have said three variables were good enough. Okay, right? But but it turns out that sometimes the network finds a solution if you keep it a bit higher dimensional because it has a little bit more room to do that. I'm just now here I'm in the blah blah territory. <laughs> okay, if you really make it three dimensionally, it will do a most probably crappier job. We know that, like the dimension, you can push it to eight, you get a little bit worse performance, but it it, it still does something. So this has more to do with the optimization. Right? Yeah, yeah. Whether the optimum would be found, even if like three to four or five dimension is good enough, neural networks parameterization most probably is not easy. In that that yeah. So it's not just the true dimensionality of this space. Okay, okay, fine. Any other question? So I would, the last one, I know it's most probably exhausting for you guys, right? Okay, you know, we have entered this sort of death contract that I'll, it will be till 1.30, so I'll make you suffer a little bit more, okay? So let me try to sweeten it by saying, this thing is a little bit about the dimension of the question as if it will please you, right? <laughs> you know, that's a bad way of getting to really how many dimensional is it? Is there a compression? Yes, okay. Exactly how much compression, maybe we can try to figure it out, right? But yeah, okay. So, so this is the, what was the last part of my thing or something called dynamic mode decomposition. And um, it's based on a certain number of hopes that almost look like against each other first, okay? One of the hopes is that despite the fact that uh, a lot of dynamics we have to deal with is nonlinear, maybe if you go to very high dimensional spaces, things would become linear, right? So the way people would try to tell you that this is possible is that imagine I have some differential equation, like, uh, like say dx dt is x plus x squared. And you say, hey, I can, say, I can make it linear, okay? You say, well, uh, it's not a linear differential equation, I can see it. I say, no, no, it's a linear differential if I call this one x1 and call this x2, and I have dx1 dt is x1 plus x2. Looks linear. You say, no, 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 you have to tell me how x2 evolves. Okay. Well, so now I start writing x squares derivative 
Okay, sorry, this is a very bad idea. Okay, so you see this is x dx dt. Then you write it out. Well, dx dt was x plus x squared, so it is x squared plus x cubed. Okay, so then I need an x3, which is x cubed. Then I can write dx2, sorry, dx2 dt is x2 plus x3. So essentially I'm cheating. Every time there is a nonlinear term, I'm calling it a new variable and I'm finding it a rule. Now, how many dimensional vector space on which things would be linear at the end of the day? Hmm? When would I stop? Huh? I'll have an infinite dimensional vector. But if I made it infinite dimensional, low voila, okay, so the price you paid for doing linear things is that you got an infinite dimensional linear problem. So we are much more people, we did sure. Want to make an infinite dimensional linear thing is nothing for us. Okay, but fine. So that is sort of the idea. But actually, this idea looks like okay, this is somebody's parlor trick. Okay, it's never going to come out of nothing is going to come out of it. Okay, but if you if you go to some other parts of machine learning, people are selling you, or rather, what was popular before neural nets again took over the world. For cardinal methods. And the idea in cardinal methods is the same, right? I have to do a classification in some lower dimensional space. I have to separate cats and dogs. The boundary is very, very wiggly between the cats and dog pictures, right? The reds and blues. But if I'm lucky and if I could have a whole function expansion and take an infinite dimensional space, well, the decision function could be a linear combination of this expanded basis, right? So in some infinite dimensional space, it's a linear separation problem, right? So this idea that A, perhaps there is some sort of infinite dimensional feature where just a dot product with W gives you the decision function. If it is positive cat, negative dog, okay, right? And also those guys tell you, that in most cases, all you need to know is the how dot product works in that space. And everything can be captured, the decision function can be written as a linear combination of some kernel function, where one leg of the kernel would be your sample space, okay? And other kernel, the other leg would roam free, okay? So this infinite dimensional expansion plus kernel tricks is something that was like, in, mid 90s, late 90s on, this was the method. Everybody was convinced neural networks are never going to work, okay? Even in early 2000s, okay? So, so, okay, so this is not such a crazy idea. Maybe let's see whether we can do this infinite dimensional thing. But see, this linear description of a nonlinear system is therefore trying to say, I'll go to very high dimensional spaces. Or if your data is already very high dimensional, maybe it's good. Right? So it doesn't say immediately I want low dimensional spaces. But what this method essentially is also saying is that the linear dynamics I'll get in that space. So remember, I had this infinite dimensional dynamics with some A matrix now evolving it forward. I'm hoping that the simplicity of the system is that matrix, this infinite dimensional matrix being effectively low up. What that means is that if I could take this infinite dimensional matrix and diagonalize it, again, we make a living of it, right? Most of its eigenvalues may be complex, their modulus is small, okay? And only few of them have either growing things or more or less marginal things or something that decays slowly, right? So it says expand the dimension, but please, please, please pray that there is a low rank dynamics in this infinite dimensions. Okay. Now, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Is just to understand correctly, is that equivalent to finding a basis in which the model is uh, linear or? It is equivalent to finding a base. Okay. So the truth is that kernel people, okay, 
anytime they give you a kernel, they have essentially given you a basis. Okay, there is this sort of buster representation which will just take the kernel and factorize it in terms of its eigenfunctions, especially when it's a compact operator. Okay, so it has a basis associated with it, right? So with kernels, okay, what you are praying is that the basis the, the grades have given you is useful for the problem. The neural net folks would come and tell you, we are a bit more flexible. We can approximate all kinds of function and you don't have to start out by knowing a kernel and a particular kind of basis that's good for this problem, okay, right? And it turns out that if you take traditional feed forward networks and take their very wide limits, they actually turn into essentially kernel methods. So neural networks in the very wide limit are particular kind of kernels, right? But finite with neural networks, in some sense, a little bit more flexible than, so again, if you found the right kernel for your problem, okay, please be happy, right? But there's no guarantee it is. So people also try the same thing, nothing intelligent. Kernel one, kernel two, kernel three, see whether you succeed. And if you cry, then okay, maybe you finally have to do the game about it. Okay. Anyway, so in the last 10 minutes, how much suffering should I put on you? Not too much. Okay. So okay, let me just give you the broad picture, okay, and call it a day because it's been a been long and I'm sure I'm exhausted, you must be more exhausted. Okay, so we have sort of all sorts of ghastly equations. Right, what we are, as we said, generally it could be nonlinear, but we want something, I want to know whether there's some change variable where it's linear. Some cases that with high dimensional things, we might say, does it look like linear to you? Okay, and the reason this subject got started, something this crazy, is actually some observations that in an odd way, things that, are, that should be nonlinear, you can find like you could things like eigenmodes there, okay? In terms of which you can describe the system pretty well. So this is some crazy example where there's somebody who observes fluid flow, has a little metal shape, a little rubber thingy that is fluctuating, fluid is going past, it is getting shed left or right anyway, meaning fluid dynamics has gone out of at least American hydraulics. I don't even understand anything, right? But when you take those, the, the flow pattern they observe, and you say, can I expand it in terms of a few modes and predict how this will evolve, and which modes are dying fast, which modes are dying slow, there seems to be all these modes with certain eigenvalues associated with it. If you pretend it's a linear system and try to fit, you do a pretty good job. And the question is, how come? Right? So, in the next 10 minutes, I'm not trying to explain how one, okay? But I'm just trying to tell you that A, there is a whole world out there, okay? Where essentially you can do the following thing, okay? Operationally, okay? Imagine you've got this excess R, think of this fluid flow picture. I saw the fluid flow picture now, it's many, many pixels, it's a big X, very long, tall vector. I see a second later what happened. That's my Y1. And then I start from another thing, I watch it. Of course, I could be lazy and I can have one whole video and I say Y1 is actually X2, okay? And Y2 is really X3, right? That's the cheaty way, right? It'll be better for you if you can start from more than one different initial conditions. You get a richer set of things, right? So I basically gave you a, plus, a, a cloud of starting point and a set of points where it ends up. And if it is high dimensional, we can go say, oh, can I find an A that makes Y into X, okay? That's actually a regression problem. If I could invert X, then life would be good, right? It will be just Y X inverse would be your best estimate thing. Life is not good because quite often, okay, X is a very, very tall vector and I have only so many samples of it. So this matrix is like a very 
sort of like the Manhattan building. Okay. But you could actually do something called pseudo inverse there using kind of SVD, right? And you can make an estimate of it, right? And you can look for its eigenvalues, right? And turns out that now if you give me a new X, if I know what the eigenvalues of A's are, I can do an expansion of X. It turns out A is not, okay? A nice matrix is not normal. It's left eigenvectors have nothing to do with right eigenvectors. But if you know the left and right eigenvectors, you can figure out how to express A in terms of this coefficient of the alpha, which are taken by dot product with left eigenvectors. And then there is right, right eigenvectors, which look like your original image. They are long and tall, okay? They are the modes, okay? And you can say, I keep only first two modes. How good is the prediction, right? Now, the next two pages, are about how you can do it completely in the sample space in very kernel style, okay? I, at this stage of exhaustion, I'm not going to torture you, right? But and uh, but you can actually go beyond, beyond this sort of dot product linear, what's called linear kernel, and use more complicated things. There are equivalent formulae for it. But let me come back to these pictures that we started out with. You can say, oh, you have this fancy neural network predicting things. Can I get my little linear model predict things in this high dimensional space? And uh, lo and behold, okay, if you keep like, you can see one more, two more, three more, four more, five more, and you're sort of predicting the final things, right? You do pretty well, okay, even with eight months. Meaning the vertical direction is a log scale, and things have fallen from 10 to the 2 to, I don't know, 10 to the minus 3, something, quite a bit, right? So it is possible to find structures by this oddball method, okay? I mean, there are days Domenico and I would say, this is working, but this can't be working, right? Okay, so there is some mystery out there. Okay, and the fact that the neural net succeeded is because there is some kind of structure that this method is getting to some sort of effective lower dimensional dynamics is very likely the same thing, the same reason. Anyway, so I think I have spent enough of your time and okay, yeah, please. So uh, this method that you talked about, DNA, yeah. there's no neural network there. There's no neural network there. Right? It's not a neural network, right, it at this some, point. Okay, so it's just some sort of like... Uh, so so the, it, it, it's kind of like the closest thing of that is actually like a kernel method that is suited to dynamics. Okay, it's trying to find a way of finding modes which are simple under dynamics by some kind of kernel approximation. Now, there are people, of course, again, if there are functions to be learned, somebody would stick in a neural net and there are versions of this where you might try to do something more neural net like, right? But in some sense, the, the attraction of this is that it's not hidden in some neural network mumbo jumbo. If you find such mode, you can ask, for example, interpretability wise, a straightforward linear algebra method, maybe better than a neural net that actually performs well, but doesn't give you much idea about, you know, why and how did it succeed? Or how many effective degrees of freedom do you have? So is it possible to like take a neural OD and do DMD on that and maybe get like more interpretability? Yeah, okay. So we didn't quite do that, but we trained on the same data. So my suspicion is that if we actually now DMD, the neural OD that we learned, which is not quite the real data, but close, we'll most probably get something similar, but it's a good question. Okay. Any other questions? Well, yeah. Generally, the actual um, cavity is just like doing something similar to Kelvin PCA. Is that the this one? 
Yeah, but like the PMD, is it like using kernel of these days? It is uh, somewhat, so there is a thing here. So when you have this access, one of the pre-processing steps of DMD is trying to do something like a PCA because the X could be quite noisy. So you first try to reduce that dimension. So it's not like, the, the operation itself is PCA, it's just like it, no, 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 no. But what I'm trying to say is that that you can do something like kernel PCA there to sort of sort of denoise the original X. But so so think of it this way. Okay, this ma makes no mathematical sense, but formally, this is what's happening. I have this X data points, vector, 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 vector. I have the Y data points, which is like what happens to these initial conditions after a short while. In general, okay, if I said it was scalars, you will say just fit Y over X. So I want to do Y X inverse with rectangular matrices. That's what I want to do, right? The DMD question is asking, when I do Y X inverse and X has lots of zero eigenvalues, how many modes do I want to have? How, how many non-trivial eigenvalues of Y X inverse to a what rank approximation do I want to do to Y X inverse? PCA is much more about what rank approximation, do a low rank approximation do I want to do to X itself or Y itself? And this is what is the low rank approximation to what should be morally yx inverse. Does it make sense? Yeah. So this is a kernelized version of that. This is trying to find out what the dynamical rule is, because that thing is supposed to estimate what your dynamical rule is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think we all can take a break. Okay. Let's thank okay. You. a few like practical announcements today. So first of all, just a reminder, while we're here, the buildings asked us to not bring any food or drinks down from the 17th floor. So please eat all your food, drink your coffee up there, or get the coffee here. Um, so for today, what we're gonna do, you don't have to. Okay, okay. I am disconnected. <laughs> you can disconnect yes. if you want. Yes. Um, all right, so for the rest of today, we're gonna go over to the flat iron now. Um, the next talk is at 11.30, so we have an extra long break. We can get coffee there, snacks, whatever. Um, and then we're going to do lunch over there also on the 11th floor. There will be bent, like boxes, box lunches um, for the whole Flatiron staff. And then you have some free time until Jan Lukens talk at 3.30. And you can just stay. There's plenty of space at the Flatiron, or you can do whatever you want until then. Uh, tomorrow, you may or may not have noticed the schedule has changed in the morning talk. We had to move to next week. So the first talk tomorrow is not until 11 a.m. Um, and it's over at the Flatiron in the seventh floor classroom we were in yesterday. So you can get breakfast at Flatiron if you want on the 11th floor. They have like oatmeal, fruit, yogurt, you know, but it's only until 10 a.m. So you can get to before 10 on the 11th floor if you want that. Or Get breakfast. Show up at 11 um, on the seventh floor at 162. And then for lunch after that talk, you can either order seamless and then it'll be, you know, at 162. Or our afternoon talk is here so you can come back to the and I'll be there if you want. Totally up to you. Um, just make sure your seamless account is up and running. It's Friday. There won't be any catered lunch. So if you want to eat, you got to be able to order. University in New Jersey, so kind of local, uh, back and forth. And I study supernovae. I'm particularly interested in modeling their spectra. And um, I'm pretty new to machine learning, so I'm excited. 
I guess I also never introduced myself. I'm Natalie. I'm on the organizing committee here. I'm a postdoc at the Flatiron. I work in the Center for Computational Biology. And I apply all kinds of algorithms, machine learning, and math to genomic data. Um, so, yeah, I have a one and a half year old daughter who's growing by herself and also doing any work to make sure that she's good. <laughs> My fun fact is that I like to rock. Rock fine. Ooh. One more announcement. If you cannot keep your mask about your mouth and your nose, you can go on soon. This is very serious because there's a lot of people getting COVID um, in the city and inside of Times So. We cannot do that. We have a Zoom. So, so that's basically how it works. And I hope that people will do that, especially if all the paper rooms are all over. You're going to have people sitting next to you the whole time. So you'll find everyone wearing a mask, especially in huge ones and the small ones. Thank you so much. And I hope you enjoy the talk today. Um, and thank you, Anna, for having us. Thank here. you for inviting me. It was fun. All right. Hey, everyone. Oh, is this a, okay? Um, I'm very excited to announce Barbara Engelhart and her talk. She uh, has been at Princeton until about a month, two months from now, and she's moving to the Gladstone Institutes in Stanford. Barbara does really, really amazing and exciting work in uh, various ML and statistical ML applications to genomics and biological data. Um, but she's going to talk today mostly about, I think, more methods, not less genomics is my understanding, unfortunately for me, but um, we'll get a really great talk on dimension reduction. So um, unfortunately, Barbara couldn't join us, but I think she is available uh, for questions via email, hopefully afterwards. Uh, and obviously, please feel free to still ask questions. Um, if we have ceiling mics, but in case she can't hear, there are also these mics on the table that you just press the button and then speak into it and she'll be able to hear your questions much more clearly. So feel free to ask and uh, please go ahead, Barbara. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. Uh, thanks Thanks to everyone for, for being here. Um, I am so sorry I'm remote. Uh, yeah, it's uh, end of the school year. I'm a single mom, so I have uh, a lot of stuff going on. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I'm really excited to speak to you though. I have to say this is uh, something I've been looking forward to for a long time and, and life, life throws curveballs at you. So today I'm mostly talking about dimension reduction. Um, the first half I think is, is uh, gonna be more of a tutorial. Um, and I'll say I'm writing right now um, a, a review article for a, a genomics journal on dimension reduction generally. So this is kind of the unorganized version of that. Um, uh, and uh, I just want to sort of give you a set of tools um, uh, for dimension reduction and think about well, why we do dimension reduction and how to do it properly. Uh, the second half, I'm gonna to talk to you about two examples from my group um, where we've done uh, different types of structured dimension reduction uh, that hopefully are gonna be informative. Um, so dimension reduction is called a lot of things. Um, if you were Tukey in 1977, you'd call it exploratory data analysis. In machine learning, we call it unsupervised learning. Um, so it, it goes by many names. Um, so the, the really high level idea is that you have a, a set of samples, which in this matrix for us, uh, thinking about biomedical data is gonna be uh, on the columns actually, it's usually transposed, but I'll explain why. Uh, and then you have a set of features uh, and those features uh, are uh, on the rows. Um, and you notice that if you think about each of these samples, right, on the columns, they're gonna live in some very high dimensional space, right? It could be the space of um, gene expression of, of 20,000 genes in the human genome. So each of these points, again, exists some point, some place in a 20,000 dimensional space. Um, and the idea behind dimension reduction, broadly writ, is to basically uh, project each of these points in this 20,000 dimensional space down to some small number of dimensions, K, where K is much, much smaller than uh, the original uh, dimensional uh, dimension of the features P. So here is just a projection uh, down to hypothetically two uh, different uh, uh, two dimensions. 
Um, and I'm gonna explain exactly what this plot is in a, in a few slides. Um, why do we do this? So uh, I know you've probably read some papers uh, in, in genomics recently. It is literally the first plot of every paper right now is some sort of T-SNE uh, visualization of, of single cell data or genomics data. However it is, uh, it's pretty much the first thing you do. When I have a new data set after I clean the data, it is also the first thing that I do is run PCA or some version. What's up? Very good. Okay, uh, run PCA or some version of, of that and uh, look, look, visualize the data. So why do we do this? Um, we do this basically for the purpose of discovery. Um, so what we're discovering is patterns and trends among a set of samples and among a set of features. Um, the idea is to develop some kind of data-driven hypothesis, uh, if I'm thinking about it in the biomedical context, which we're then gonna take and test out of sample. In fact, these hypotheses can be used to design experiments that we actually run and uh, test out of sample. Um, the, the objective is, is really sort of the fitted model rather than prediction. So supervised learning, of course, uh, thinks about prediction um, and, and the covariates, but uh, this is quite different. It's, it's sort of thinking about the interpreted model um, and you know, what it looks like, really. Um, often the analysis is visual, uh, where we actually just look at the, the components and figure out what they mean. Um, so dementia reduction standard, you know, if we think about just PCA or factor analysis, it's quite different when we think about biomedical data. And the reason is this. Um, when we think about dementia reduction, it basically requires some sort of fixed N number of samples um, and a very large N, uh, no, sorry, uh, some sort of um, fixed G, sorry, or P, uh, a large number of, of features or genes, um, but then the samples are going to be large and growing. So we can think about this in terms of like cat pictures on the internet where there's only, you know, uh, maybe a thousand pixels, but uh, there's many trillions of, of cat pictures on the internet. Um, we could think about it as emails where uh, there's a vocabulary that's fairly fixed. Those are our features, uh, but the emails grow and grow and grow as we get more of them. There's millions in growing. We can think about it as newspaper articles where again, we have a fixed vocabulary and the, the number of samples just keeps on growing. And again, the, the goal here is to take this a uh, large and growing number of samples and project all of them down to this two-dimensional space somehow. Um, and, and we're gonna do that by essentially taking this fixed set of features and uh, figuring out how to combine them to think about how they work together uh, and, and uh, basically project each of those uh, features down to just two of them or you know, some very small number. Um, so why biomedical data is different is because in general, the samples are small. Uh, and in fact, they're often a lot smaller than the number of features. Uh, so when we think about dementia reduction in, in a statistical setting, uh, the number of samples is basically required to be larger than the number of features, um, simply because we want to make sure that uh, uh, statistically, uh, mathematically, uh, that what we're doing is, is the right thing. And I'll explain what that means in a, in a few slides. Um, uh, but in this case, actually, our samples are usually a lot um, a, a lot smaller than our, um, our genes or our features. Uh, so it causes a lot of problems, actually. Uh, another thing that goes, diff goes wrong in biomedical data is that uh, the samples uh, have a lot of structure to them. So in uh, statistical settings, we often assume that the samples don't have that much structure. In fact, we assume IID, uh, independent and identically distributed. And for biological samples, actually, they generally have a lot of structure. Uh, structure could mean a lot of things. We're going to talk about that in the second half of the talk. Uh, but a lot of dementia reduction methods that I'm going to show you in the first half uh, don't uh, basically assume IID samples. And this is absolutely not the case. So there are reasons why dementia reduction is hard. Um, that said, it is definitely one of the major workhorses of biomedical data analysis. So here's just three uh, really high level examples. Um, Here's bulk RNA sequencing data, uh, where uh, this is a, a T-SNE plot actually, uh, looking at gene expression levels uh, in 20,000 dimensions from about uh, 52 different uh, human uh, tissue types. And you can see the clustering really nicely. And even though these labels were held out uh, for the original uh, dimension reduction, when we overlay the labels on top of each of the points, uh, we see that there's very nice clustering among the different tissue types. 
Um, here's population structure. We're going to come back to this example in a little bit, but uh, this is from a beautiful paper from November et al. in 2008. And they found that if they use genotypes, uh, 20,000 or 200,000, sorry, genotypes from uh, people across Europe, and each of these points represents uh, the uh, location of their four grandparents that all came from the same town, basically. Uh, you can see that actually in two dimensions, the principal components recapitulate the geography of Europe really nicely, which was kind of shocking at the time, but of course makes sense. Uh, and similarly, here's a single cell analysis where um, we're doing dimension reduction here. And again, uh, even holding out the, the, the labels of the cell types, we see that this clusters really nicely uh, into the different cell types here. So what can you do with dimension reduction? Why would we do it? Well, uh, quite a number of reasons, I would say. Um, so the first one, I think, which is sort of the ubiquitous one is visualization, right? So first thing you want to do is be able to visualize this really high dimensional data, look at how these points are related to each other, right? Each of the samples. Um, so again, that's why we do TSNI or PCA is sort of the first plot for every single, every single huge data set that we have. Um, some people use it for smoothing, which I actually really like, and, and we do this a lot in EQTL analysis, where uh, you think about, uh, for example, running principal components analysis on all of your data, uh, and then the first maybe 10, 50, depending on the size of your data sets, uh, data set, um, uh, the first principal components can be used actually to reconstruct uh, a new matrix Y. Um, you have the old matrix Y, you decompose it using PCA, and then you build a new Y hat, which is actually just the, the two uh, low dimensional matrices uh, multiplied together where you're only using, let's say 50 principal components instead of 2000. Um, that's, uh, uh, that's a way to basically get rid of a lot of the variation uh, that uh, may or may not affect biological signal, but it's a way to sort of clean and smooth the data. Uh, imputation uh, of missing data is another thing that we can do in, in some probabilistic models, where essentially you have a, a Y matrix that, that is missing a lot of points. Uh, you can do probabilistic dimension reduction and actually, again, just do the reconstruction of Y hat, where all of the missing points in there are, are uh, filled in by the expected values from the, um, the, the two low dimensional matrices multiplied together. Uh, another thing that uh, we actually do a lot Robert, in, oh yeah. Do we have a question? So, sorry, yeah. this is coming from me who doesn't know any biology. Um, I'm curious when you use like the 50 PCA components and yeah. you drop the rest, like for biomedical data, do you worry about dropping the sort of yes. outlier situation and yes. how do you compensate those situations? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it comes up in a lot of different ways. Uh, it's basically an art and not a science. I wish I could tell you some official answer, but um, as you know, uh, these, these low dimensional uh, uh, factors do not necessarily catch, uh, capture uh, one thing, right? It's not necessarily, you know, batch or uh, population structure or something like that. It could be a combination of a lot of different things that are going into each of the factors. So when you remove one, you run the, actually run the risk, like you're saying, of removing real, real signal. Um, you can never guarantee that you're not removing real signal. So it's a problem. It's hard to do. Yeah, good question. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, vector quantization. I don't know how many people have heard of this, but from the machine learning standpoint, this is actually a way of doing encoding where essentially you uh, uh, cluster the features offline and then project each of the, uh, the, the sets of features to a low dimensional space. You can even do it just with simple mixture models. And it's often used in, um, in image analysis, for example, to encode images. Um, we can control for confounders very similarly to, uh, to the question that was just asked, but um, sort of also similarly with smoothing, where uh, we might see that there are particular dimensions in PCA, for example, in our, in our projection uh, that correlate really strongly with batch or with uh, the person running the experiment. Uh, and those things, uh, you know, often you can just remove them wholesale at the risk, again, of, of removing real signal. Um, we can use it for prediction, uh, sort of like I said before, you know, where you're representing uh, this high dimensional Y matrix with two lower dimensional matrices. You can predict in that you can put a new, uh, uh, put a new sample in there, uh, see what the projection looks like and reconstruct it, um, reconstruct that value for, um, uh, for the, the Y sample again. Um, we can find parts of the whole. So this is actually what we're going to focus on a lot here, where 
um, these, these representations in this lower dimensional space often mean something. And if they're sparse representations, in other words, there's only a handful of features going into each of these dimensions, and I'll show you what this looks like, um, uh, then we can actually look at what those parts represent and see if they represent something interesting about the, the data. Uh, that's how we sort of find these patterns. Um, the way I think about it, and again, I'm going to show you a lot of pictures of this, is that these methods really decompose variation. So we're very interested in, in variation and co-variation among the features, right? Um, we're interested in how all the genes interact, uh, what the variation looks like. And we'd like to be able to explain that variation in terms of a number of different processes, whether it's experimental uh, uh, covariates like batch, like uh, whoever the technician is that ran the experiment, or whether it's biological covariates, like um, uh, the population of the individual or uh, you know, genotype of the individual um, or something else uh, related to that. Uh, so we'd like to decompose variation and then explain variation uh, using by labeling each of those uh, components. Okay, so I argue um, that uh, dimension reduction is undervalued in these analyses because it's just really hard to do correctly or right. Um, Many other problems I've listed below, but um, a lot of the assumptions that go into these models um, are not well characterized. So a lot of people use PCA or TSNE without articulating um, exactly what the assumptions are of those methods. And then they run into trouble later when those, uh, those dimensions are uh, subject to uh, incorrect assumptions and they sort of can't back themselves out of it. Uh, there's no null hypothesis. So unlike statistical hypothesis testing, we'd like to, for example, say, what would these data look like without um, this particular pattern hidden in them, right? Without this particular source of variation. Uh, and it's really hard to do that. Uh, so it's hard to talk about a null hypothesis. Uh, similarly, there are very few tests of statistical significance, right? We can't say how statistically significant a pattern is. We can often say how much variance it, it explains, but that's quite different than statistical significance. Uh, often the conclusions we draw based on dimension reduction are not based on qualitative, but quantitative, uh, or sorry, are based on qualitative, but not quantitative evidence. Uh, so often we just look at clustering and explain why, uh, explain why the dimension reduction worked in that setting, which is TSNE or, or UMAP, a lot of those methods uh, do that. Um, I think the real issue that I think about and sort of one of the major take home messages from today is that oversimplified or, or incorrectly specified models might miss biologically important patterns. So it's really important to think about which method you're gonna choose and why, whether it matches your data set, whether it matches the questions and the patterns you'd like to extract from those data. Uh, and I think uh, importantly in the world that we live in, the results from dimension reduction are often really hard to evaluate. We, we don't have really quantitative ways to evaluate them all the time. They're hard to validate in the sense that it's hard to uh, look at out of sample um, uh, um, out of sample measurements uh, to, to make sure that they're doing the right thing. And they're hard to reproduce in the sense that um, if we get two different samples uh, from a, a slightly different population, uh, it, often the principal components are way off uh, from uh, the, the original ones. Uh, so these are the problems. Uh, we're gonna keep on talking about that. Um, so I'm just going to do a really high level overview of four, um, uh, four dimension reduction methods that uh, we use a lot in, um, in genomic and biomedical data sets. Uh, the first one is T-SNE. Uh, so this is T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding model. Um, so uh, I, I'm not really going to talk about this much to explain, much other than to explain the geometry of it. Uh, but what I'll tell you is that, um, again, without giving too many details, basically T-SNE is just the KL divergence uh, mapping uh, Gaussian uh, to a T distribution, okay? Um, so here's a Gaussian 2D distribution. Here's a probability density. Uh, and here's a student's uh, T uh, 2D distribution. Uh, and what you should take home from this, although it's hard to see from these plots, these are just MATLAB plots, um, what you should take home from it is that actually the tails of the student's T distribution are much heavier uh, than the Gaussian. Um, so you can see also that the peak actually, if you look at the sort of equivalent of the Y axis is much lower here. So this peak is much higher. Uh, so you can imagine that this is sort of a really peaky version of a Gaussian distribution. And what we're trying to do is uh, sort of spread it out um, uh, in the tails with the student's T distribution, okay? So, 
to put it a little bit more bluntly, what we're going to do is let's say we've we've mapped these uh, points down to two dimensions hypothetically. Um, we choose a, a perplexity parameter, which basically just puts a Gaussian ball, I, I think of it as, um, around the particular point we're talking about. So here's the, the red point is the one we're talking about. Uh, here's our Gaussian ball, which again, this ball size is determined by the perplexity parameters. Um, and what KL divergence does in this case um, for Gaussian to T uh, is it basically uh, shrinks heavily any of the points that are within that Gaussian ball, right? Um, to handle the uh, sort of peakiness of the Gaussian. And it pushes away pretty strongly all of the points outside that Gaussian ball. Um, so what that means is if you've ever seen uh, a T or if you've ever seen T SNE with sort of uh, perplexity too high or too low, you kind of get one of these extremes where either you have really, really tight clusters and it's just sort of a, a little too obvious, or whether you have really uh, dispersed uh, points in the space, um, right? Where your Gaussian ball is just way too small in that case. Um, another thing that this uh, sort of uh, description of it um, uh, explains is why you can't really go higher than two dimensions using T-SNE. Uh, so if you think about Gaussian balls, right? Um, actually, it's the case where um, in higher dimensions than about three, uh, I mean, especially if you get to like 10 dimensions, uh, pretty much every single point is sitting almost exactly on that ball, um, just because of the way uh, the, the confidence intervals work here. Um, so uh, basically every single point either shrinks uh, right towards each other or disperses away from each other, given this KL divergence. Um, so uh, these are these are the problems with TSNE, and yet it's still used pretty much ubiquitously uh, in in well a lot in uh, in, in genomics data sets. Um, I'm going to talk about a slightly different thing today. Um, I'm going to mostly focus on linear dimension reduction, uh, where uh, we have this very uh, uh, straightforward formulation. We have a matrix X, um, which is our again uh, samples by features. And we're going to decompose this matrix X into um, a set of uh, weights, lambda, um, and a set of uh, uh, factors, Z, okay? So this is the very, very, very high level version of what we're trying to do. And, and what I want you to note here is that the uh, number of columns of Z and the number of rows of lambda are going to be small relative to everything else. So, uh, you know, whatever the, the, the sample size are, whatever the uh, uh, features are, whatever those numbers are, uh, we're trying to project to a much lower dimensional space. So ultimately, when you think about um, these two matrices, Z and Lambda representing X, we're going to be able to represent X in a, in a lower dimensional space than the original data itself. And that's how it gets this sort of cleaning uh, data cleaning, uh, decomposition kind of um, uh, kind of uh, reputation uh, abilities uh, because of this lower dimensional representation. Okay, are there any questions about this? All right. Can I ask a um, oh, oh yeah? Can I ask a motivational question before we go? Yeah. On? Um, totally. So you mentioned earlier, like you have situations where you have labeled biological data, like in those situations, do you still care about unsupervised methods or can you just like, yeah, like what, what would be the advantage of that over something supervised? Yeah, I'm gonna give you two examples of that in the second half, if that's okay. Um, uh, it's, it's a really good question. It's actually one that I've been like uh, hitting my head against the wall for two years now. And I think we just came out with a couple of methods that actually start to address that. But I, um, is it okay if I put that off for a little bit? Yeah, totally. <laughs> okay, great. I'll show you how we do that. Um, yes, uh, yeah. So, so again, this this makes all the sort of uh, assumptions that you uh, that we that we uh, know from uh, uh, <laughs> statistics, where each of the samples here are uh, are going to be um, IID, and we haven't talked about the distributions yet and the the distributional assumptions, but we're going to specify those next. So uh, the most common, I would say, uh, dimension reduction method in the world, <laughs> probably, uh, is principal components analysis. Um, I'm specifically focusing on the, the probabilistic version, which is from Sam Royce, uh, 1998, and then Tipping and Bishop in 1999. Um, the idea behind principal components is that it takes, let's say, this two-dimensional uh, uh, space, this two-dimensional data set, and it pulls out uh, the directions that maximize variation. So principal component one is gonna be uh, this vector right here. 
uh, that basically maximizes, uh, identifies the, the maximum variation uh, in, in these two dimensional data. Then principal component two is gonna be uh, this vector right here, which is by definition, the orthogonal one to the prior one, uh, but it sort of gets the second dimension. And we're gonna keep talking about the, uh, what this means uh, in, in pictures. Um, uh, PCA, whether, whether we want it to or not, makes very strong Gaussian assumptions about the data. And there are uh, versions that relax that, but uh, these are, there are uh, strong Gaussian assumptions when we think about PCA generally. Um, in this case, both Z and Lambda are going to be in the, in the reals, um, so they're going to be positive and negative, some might be zero. Uh, in general, there's little sparsity, though, so when we think about uh, these two uh, matrices, Z and Lambda, um, we're going to see very few zeros in them. Uh, so in other words, when we think about each of the factors, they're going to basically uh, explain a, a lot of variation in, in all of the Xs um, in, in all of the different samples. Similarly with Lambda, um, uh, they're generally going to be composed of, I think of lambda sort of the weights on the features. Uh, each, each factor is going to be um, uh, composed of pretty much all of the different uh, features in the X, the original X. Uh, so little sparsity, hard to interpret sometimes. So uh, one way to think about PCA um, that's different than the two that I sort of just uh, uh, referred to previously is a way to minimize reconstruction error. Um, so here, we basically like to choose the Z and the Lambda variables that minimize uh, the distance, uh, the reconstruction error between X and uh, Z Lambda, okay? So uh, again, a very toy example of this is that we have uh, X in two dimensions, right? X1, X2, here are all of our red points is X. Uh, and we'd like to uh, find the uh, principal component, um, uh, the space that, um, that, that maximizes the, the, or minimizes the reconstruction error, sorry. So the way that we're going to do that is, let's say this is our, our perfect principal component here, this uh, uh, orange dotted line. And this is gonna be the line where if you project each of these points uh, directly to the line, um, uh, then uh, the points that are sitting on the line, these are gonna be the lower dimensional projection, right? Of each of these points. Uh, the distance between the original uh, point uh, out here and the projected points here uh, is going to be the smallest. Okay, so we're trying to again choose this line that uh, where when you project all the points to that line, it minimizes uh, the, the distance, the residual. Uh, that's reconstruction error. So that's sort of a third way to think about uh, think about PCA. Um, when you actually look at what happens in PCA, I'm gonna show you a bunch of examples of PCA and other things, but um, when you look at what happens with PCA, you get these things that people call eigengenes or eigenfaces. They're basically going to be um, sort of meta representations um, of uh, different uh, sort of classes of, in this case, face pictures of faces uh, across your sample. So here you can see a lot of uh, a positive, uh, these are the dark weights and uh, negative, these are the very light weights, um, uh, pixels in these regions. And you can see different eyebrows appearing across the different samples. You can see different types of chins. You can see the mouths in different, uh, in different situations, uh, bigger upper lips or smaller upper lips. Um, eyes are obviously slightly different as well. Um, hairline is gonna be different in each of them too. Um, so again, these are, these are sort of uh, referred to as eigenfaces, but again, you can just sort of add them up. This is the example. You can sort of add up each of these eigenfaces um, with weights on each of them, and then you're going to get the full picture, okay? Uh, this is actually a, 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 an example from Lee and Sung in, in 1999. This is their um, uh, non-negative matrix factorization paper, which we'll talk about next. But again, if you look at eigenfaces here, the first thing it does, the first thing PCA will do is get the mean face. So this is literally the pixel average of every single face. And then when you think about what it does next, you can look across the other eigenfaces and you can see, well, the first one actually differentiates the right side from the left side, right? You can see uh, uh, red there and, and bluer there. Um, and then you can see sort of top and bottom being differentiated. Um, so it kind of does differences from the average, right? Where the average is again, the first principal component, okay? And then again, every single face is gonna be some positive or negative weighting of each of these uh, different eigenfaces to create the whole. Uh, but overall, this is gonna be a much smaller representation uh, of the data than the original, you know, 100,000 pictures that we had, right? This is gonna be fairly small. 
Here's a, an example that I show in my class that I just really appreciate. Um, so what um, uh, what these researchers did is they grabbed a whole bunch of scary things, right? These are called risk factors, whether it's nuclear war or microwave ovens. And they gave a, a whole bunch of people a survey about um, how scary they were, what they were scared about. Um, and uh, then they just ran PCA on the survey results. Um, and I thought this was just so fascinating. So here's a rotated version of uh, their principal components. But what you can see is that there's kind of uh, really interesting labels on here. So over here, uh, we, they call it dread risk, where it's like nuclear weapons fallout, nuclear weapons and war. Uh, there's a lot of really scary stuff there where you know we're not going to survive very well. Here, it's kind of the opposite, where caffeine, aspirin, these are sort of like um, necessary evils, I guess you could say, where they're not necessarily that, that uh, terrifying and the effects aren't going to be that big. Uh, axis two, they've labeled uh, the risk. Right here, are the unknown risk where we really don't know what's going on with DNA technology. This is from like the 1980s, I should say, and microwave ovens and nitrates. We, we, we know a little bit better now, but not perfect. Whereas over here, we know exactly what happens when you set off some fireworks or you blow up a dynamite or you have an auto accident. Right. There's nothing, nothing unknown about that. So I love the way that these uh, sort of fell out and, and, and in terms of thinking about the relationship between uh, each of these different risk factors. Uh, and again, they, they sort of separated them into dread risk versus uh, unknowable risk. Um, and uh, I'll ask you this question now. It's sort of uh, think about uh, how you might do this. One of the sort of essential steps in dimension reduction is to essentially label and interpret each of the factors uh, in the dimension reduction. So uh, think about how you might do that uh, in genomic data, in, in biomedical data generally. But here we can just uh, sort of eyeball it and, and see uh, these uh, label these two uh, factors. Um, the next method that I wanted to tell you about is shockingly straightforward uh, and also shockingly powerful. It's non-negative matrix factorization. So again, this was developed by uh, Lian Sung in 1999, and the idea here is really just to take a non-negative matrix V, right, and decompose it into W and H. Uh, and the only rule here, the, the biggest rule here, is that W and H are non-negative. Um, and in a, a bunch of follow-up papers, uh, they explain how to do this very, very fast. So you can actually do non-negative matrix factorization for very large, uh, very large matrices V. Um, also, you can have a probabilistic in in interpretation of it. We're going to talk about that a little later again. Um, but uh, the key again is that W and H are both non-negative. Um, so what this does, interestingly enough, is uh, this non-negativity constraint encourage encourages extreme sparsity. Uh, and the reason things are so sparse is because you can never subtract anything, right? You just have to add, add, add to get the final result. So uh, there's sparsity in two dimensions here, right? There's both sparsity in the number of features that can be involved because you kind of need sort of the minimal building blocks um, uh, to be able to represent everything uh, with no negativity without being able to subtract any of these factors. Um, but there's also a sparsity in the um, number of factors that explain any of the samples, uh, because again, you don't want to uh, have to uh, use all of the different parts to be able to explain every sample. Um, just thinking about it in terms of the constraints here. Uh, and again, the, the geometry, the non-negativity is why this happens. We're not, just like PCA, we're not going to see the first factor here being the mean, uh, because again, we can't go both directions from the mean. We can only build up. Um, so this leads to what people in dimension reduction generally call a parts-based representation. This gets at something very, very different uh, than PCA. So here's another example also, for, oh, here's an example of NMF, uh, non-negative matrix factorization from the same faces example that you saw from PCA before. And again, what you see is something very different. Um, the, the dark areas here represent one thing, right? Whether it's a mouth or a mustache or one side of the face or a particular region in the forehead or a chin or uh, right underneath your nose or your eyes, it's gonna be a part, right? Um, which is just, I think, so cool. Uh, and you're gonna see a lot of sparsity here too, right? There's a lot of things, uh, pixels here that have no weights on them at all. And similarly, in the uh, uh, factor matrix, you're going to see um, a lot of sparsity there too, where uh, the parts that represent this original face um, are drawn from only a handful of the parts represented in the, NM, uh, in the NMF comp, uh, decomposition. Okay, so this is a, a, another thing with this totally different set of behaviors. 
Here's an example uh, that again, uh, uh, Lee and Sung put on the non-negative or put on an encyclopedia data set. So this is just a set of words. Um, uh, well, a set of articles about things like the constitution of the United States. Um, and here's four uh, sort of representative uh, factors where each of the uh, words here are the highest um, or the 10 highest uh, represented uh, words for each of these factors. And you can see, you know, here's court, government, council, culture, supreme, you know, various sort of government. Here's president, served, governor, secretary, state, um, elected. So this is more about, yeah, elections and things like that. Uh, so in order to describe the constitution, we see that we're going to weight these top two uh, factors uh, and we're going to be able to describe the words that we see uh, in this encyclopedia entry. Uh, we don't see any representation from this flower uh, factor or these disease factors. Uh, basically, no words uh, need to be built um, into this, uh, into this to, to be able to explain this encyclopedia entry. Okay, uh, so that's how NMF works. Okay. I'll add a question. Yeah. So going back to the last like two slides, um, do you have to give the weighting matrix, and how do you decide how to weight it? Yeah, you know, a lot of these, um, a lot of these uh, dimension reduction methods. So you don't give it anything. You only give it the original samples by pixel values. That's literally it. Uh, for this example, for the words example, you just give it uh, 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 samples or articles, let's say, by uh, a vocabulary, and each uh, element is going to be the count of how many words uh, of each of those vocabulary words exist in that article. So uh, the, the dimension reduction is all done by the method. In this case, the dimension reduction is done by uh, constrained optimization. Um, in PCA or, or some of the, the uh, other models we talk about, we can uh, do it in terms of optimizing the reconstruction error. Uh, we can also do it probabilistically uh, by forcing certain priors on, uh, on the factors and the loadings and uh, uh, just running statistical inference. So nothing is given besides the original matrix. It's, it's kind of astounding that this works so, <laughs> so beautifully, but it really does have to do with the constraints of the problem, the geometric constraints. It's, it's quite amazing. Yeah, it does. I have to say the first time anyone hears about, I think LDA actually, this latent Dirichlet allocation, it really does genuinely feel like magic um, just because the results are so, uh, uh, so clearly the way we think. Uh, and I think that has to do with a lot of sparsity, but you really don't give it any information um, beyond, the, beyond the original matrix. So uh, the world kind of changed, I would say, in 1999 and then again in 2003 when these two Leighton Dirichlet allocation papers came out. So the Pritchard Stevens uh, Donnelly paper in 1999 basically was entirely the same model as the Bly et al. in 2003 paper. And yet they basically didn't know about each other for about four or five years until all of a sudden worlds collided and they realized it was the same model. And both of these papers by you know 2007, let's say, had about 10,000 citations each. They're all very, very, they're both very popular methods, but they are the same model at the end of the day. Um, so topic models uh, identify basically a small number of, of words or features uh, to capture each topic or factor. Um, and then, just like in uh, uh, NMF, uh, it identifies a small number of topics that explain each document, where now a document is going to be a sample. Uh, the topic proportions sit on a simplex, so we can do cool things like this, where let's just say for a particular sample here, uh, we can actually describe um, in terms of proportions uh, how each topic or factor explains that, uh, that particular sample. Um, uh, both of the decomposed matrices end up being very sparse, which I'll show you some examples of. Um, that mostly is a function of the likelihood of the data, and uh, I'll talk about that offline if you want me to. Um, it requires non-negative uh, a data matrix. The original uh, X matrix is going to be uh, non-negative. Yeah? Question? OK. Um, probably feedback for me. OK, so this is what the model looks like. And oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I was just wondering, all the images are in black and white. Is there a reason for that? Is it like... Oh, is this black and white? Oh, no, no, the 3D images. Like, oh, the 3D. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, no, they can be anything. Uh, you can do different channels of pixel colors or anything you want. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. 
Um, okay, so uh, this is the model. Uh, and really the thing to take away from this is that our two matrices Z, this is our, our Z matrix, just like before, which is uh, D by N, the, the number of dimensions uh, times N the number of, or by N the number of samples. Uh, and then uh, beta is going to be our loadings matrix, which basically describes uh, uh, the K uh, 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 words, this is our vocabulary, by uh, uh, D, which is going to be the, uh, again, the number of, um, uh, oh, documents, I'm saying it wrong, but yes, oh, sorry, uh, let me try this again. Uh, theta here is going to be the, the uh, factor matrix, which again is, which appropriately is going to be number of documents, uh, which is uh, the samples by K. Uh, and then this beta is going to be the number of um, uh, vocabulary words or features by um, K, the number of um, topics. Uh, and you can see that there's Dirichlet distributions on uh, theta and beta. So both of them, again, are going to sit on a simplex, which means uh, that each uh, column of both of them are going to uh, be non-negative and sum to one. Uh, and then the Z and W uh, distributions are both going to be multinomial uh, values there. So here's a great uh, sort of uh, uh, representation of LDA that I kind of love from, uh, from the original paper, the, the black paper. Um, so the idea here is that we'd like to explain every single word in this, uh, uh, this document here. And this is, happens to be a genetic document. Uh, but the idea is that every single word we have is going to essentially be assigned to one of the topics that we have. And here the topic that explains, uh, let's see, uh, organism uh, is going to be topic two, which is uh, sort of some combination of life and evolve and organism. Uh, topic over here is going to be uh, genes, or the word over here is genes, and this is going to be explained by the first topic, you know, gene, DNA, and genetic. Uh, some other ones might be computational, uh, right, where computational is certainly not going to be explained by those first two topics, it'll be explained by this one. Uh, and then when you look over all of the words in the document, right, uh, you're going to be able to look at a set of proportions that explain uh, why, how each of these words were sort of generated uh, in this document. So now this document, again, can be said to be made up of three different topics, right? It's going to be um, a, a DNA, it's going to be evolutionary biology, and it's going to be computational biology. And uh, again, it feels sort of like magic the first time you hear about it, but this is just a function of the likelihood that we put uh, and the constraints that we put on these uh, parameters, and uh, you can pull these, this information out really nicely. And there's a lot of sparsity in this model too, as I said. Um, so here's an example from Rosenberg et al. Uh, in 2003. Um, each of the uh, columns, the, the sort of, you can sort of see the pixelated columns here, uh, is going to be a single individual. This is going to be their genotype. This is the HapMap uh, data set. And uh, what each of the colors represent is either K equals two populations up to K equals six different populations, being able to describe the genotypes that we see in each of these individuals. Uh, and you can see that uh, the, the populations that we identify uh, very much match uh, population ancestry. So here is um, a lot of the um, uh, East Asian uh, populations. Uh, here we see um, a lot of the uh, South Asian populations. Uh, here is going to be um, uh, European. Uh, and here is going to be uh, African populations. And uh, there's actually a, a bunch of uh, Central and South America where uh, if you uh, if you go deep enough in terms of the number of populations, then you can see uh, sort of unique populations coming up there, which is uh, specific to Central and South America. Um, let me, uh, I'll show you an example from one of my papers that I thought uh, uh, was kind of crazy when it actually showed up on my screen, but here it is. Um, so this is uh, from actually the November et al. 2008 paper. They measured 1,000 individuals uh, at about 200,000 genomic locations, and they measured them all across Europe. So every single one of these 1,000 individuals had four grandparents that they could locate to essentially the same place in Europe. Um, the linear projection uh, of this enormous, enormous matrix was uh, 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 pushed down to two dimensions. So here's three different examples of that. Um, and of course, as you can see, the projected data definitely do a good job of recapitulating Europe. So you can see um, uh, Spain over here, here's the UK in purple in each of these, or sorry, in <laughs> green. Um, and then uh, over here, we see Greece, for example, in Italy, 
Uh, and actually you can see some of the islands, which are uh, just absolutely amazing. We set Cyprus um, and uh, yeah, all these four points or five points over here and these four points over here uh, uh, in every single one of these projections keep coming out uh, of the uh, of, of the, the standard clustering, which is I think quite impressive. Um, so the one thing I wanted to say was as much as we do very, they do very different things, um, they have very different objectives. Actually, uh, the results you get from three different methods are, are quite similar for these data. So here's principal components analysis where you see a fairly tight, uh, a tight mass of, of this uh, clustering. Um, here's something that, that uh, I call a sparse factor analysis. Um, where you can kind of see these, uh, the rotated versions to match the map of Europe, but these are zeros in the sparsity, um, but you can still see a map of Europe really nicely. Uh, and then this is actually um, actually the LDA, latent Dirichlet allocation model, where in this case, as opposed to having two factors, we actually put four factors representing each of the corners. Um, so even though we had to have twice the number of factors, we can actually pull out that map of Europe really nicely, but you do see more uh, sort of regularization. This is going to be shrinking to zero um, in each of these different dimensions, um, just because of, again, the, the different uh, uh, assumptions in uh, latent Dirichlet allocation. Here's another example um, from a recent paper from uh, 2021 from uh, Karin Pelka's uh, group. Um, and the idea here is that they have a, a really large number of uh, single cell uh, sequencing um, cells from an RNA sequencing uh, from uh, tumors, from uh, specifically colorectal cancer tumors. Uh, and they did two types of analyses, right? They did TSNI up here, uh, which you can see uh, gives you a lot of uh, really interesting clusters, uh, all these lines. Uh, and what they did was then within each of the clusters, they uh, uh, labeled the different cell types with the actual cell type labels. This is, of course, information that's kept out when they're doing the original TSNI. Uh, and you can see, of course, that it, it corresponds really, really nicely. And actually, other um, aspects of these cells also correspond fairly nicely. This one's a little less nice. Um, they also ran uh, non-negative matrix factorization. And the results were, this is just the TSNI projection. Um, but uh, they labeled, they colored uh, each of the cells uh, that are made up of each of the different um, uh, sort of gene programs or parts or factors from NMF uh, in, in each of these pictures. And you can see that these are very specific gene programs that each of these factors identified. Here, it's just going to be a small, uh, a small set of um, uh, cells over here and down here um, in stromal uh, and myeloid uh, cells that exhibit this particular part, this particular uh, gene program. Uh, and you can see that again, uh, it's gonna be gene programs that are kind of found ubiquitously. I really like this picture because I think it does such a good job of explaining how um, or like fundamentally different uh, you know, T-SNE is from uh, the NMF uh, type of decompositions. So um, are there any questions at this point? I'm gonna go on to probabilistic versions. Barbara, can you hear us? Yeah. Okay, you can hear me. Maybe we'll just have to pass this. There are some questions, but I don't know that our mics are working. So okay. who had questions? I'll give you this mic. I had a question about um, a few slides back about the Europe. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, do you know by any chance how they managed to get the locations of the clusters to manage the physical location? Uh, I mean, that's entirely the structure in the data. So looking at it just mm. from uh, principal components analysis, right? These were literally the two principal components that explained the most variation in this genomic data, right? And those, and again, mapping it down to two dimensions, it just happened to perfectly match um, in, mm. in two dimensions, the geography of the space. Of course, this represents sort of um, evolution uh, in space, uh, showing that there is quite a lot of structure, actually quite a lot of variation in genotype data, even for people who uh, live populations that live right next to each other. Interesting. Thanks. Hi. Uh, basically, my question is, what type of guarantees can we give when using this type of methods like TISME? Because by playing around, you can it seems that you can basically make this pretty picture somehow from any kind of data set. That's right. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think there, are, you know, give or take, no guarantees, right? Um, so, 
just because your reconstruction error is low or just because you've minimized the KL divergence between you know, a Gaussian, uh, Gaussian onto a, 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 a T distributed uh, system doesn't mean much, right? I mean, it, it means what it means. Uh, there are no guarantees in terms of the interpretation. That's the problem, right? Um, so again, thinking about it as uh, decomposing variation uh, there's no guarantees that it's going to sort of align with a particular type of variation. Uh, there's no guarantees of sparsity, even though sparsity generally happens in these non-negative models. Um, uh, you have very few guarantees. You just um, when I when I think about doing these uh, these analyses, I really think about just um, taking the assumptions that we know that they have and sort of putting them onto the results, trying the results 100 different times in 100 different ways with many different normalizations, many different factor numbers, um, and just making sure that there is some sort of reproducible signal that comes out of them. Because uh, like you said, there, uh, there's very little guarantees. This is part of why it's hard, because it ends up being more of an art than a science sometimes. Um, I have one more question about the yeah. Europe data. Or so, the clustering method is separate from the dimensionality reduction here. So I, I, you might have mentioned it, but is this nope. like a k-means or something? Yeah, no. So actually, it's not. So what we've done here is just projected uh, each of these samples, these one hundred uh, thousand. I'm sorry, just thousand samples down to two dimensions. And then what we did was we we overlaid uh, the location, the geographic location of their four grandparent ancestors on top of that. But the, the uh, four grandparent ancestors were held out, um, the locations were held out in the, in, the de um, in the dimension reduction. Does that make oh, sense? Okay, so those colors are known labels. They're not from like- They're known labels, but they were okay. held out of the dimension reduction, exactly. Okay, all right, thank you. Good, good, yep. Cool, other questions? I don't see other questions. So I think you can go on. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll, I'll go back to that really quickly though. That's one thing you can do with dementia reduction is basically uh, you know, project everything down and then do like k-means clustering or whatever you'd like to do in the lower dimensional space. People do that a lot um, just to be able to not have this really high dimensional distance matrix. Uh, you can just do something really easy in the lower dimensional space. Okay. So um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, my work. We're going to go fast through this just because it's a bunch of sort of thinking about dimension reduction generally. And the way I think about it, like I said, is this probabilistic way. Um, if you have questions, stop me. I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. Um, so, um, so when I think about dimension reduction, I think about it probabilistically, where again, you have this, this Y matrix, um, which is going to be features by samples, N uh, by P in this case or P by N technically, where I've transposed it from the, the standard because of the big data problems. Uh, so what we're gonna do is decompose that into a set of factors, uh, sorry, a set of factors X, which is gonna be K by N, and a set of loadings Lambda, which is gonna be P by K, okay? Uh, and the way that we think about this, just in terms of very vanilla factor analysis, is that each of our Y, I, J elements, so a single point in this matrix, is gonna be able to be described uh, from a Gaussian, where um, the mean value is going to be the product of uh, the appropriate lambda and x uh, factors, right? Uh, each of the each of the k factors there, uh, and uh, the variance term is going to be j specific. In this case, j is going to be gene specific. So every single gene is allowed its own variation. Okay. So um, yes. Yeah, so that's. So that's the probabilistic model. I'll, I'll add over here that this epsilon or Gaussian noise, this is just gonna be the, the assumption that this is gonna be mean zero uh, variance term tau uh, inverse. Um, so this is, uh, this is epsilon. It should be white noise if we're doing it right. So um, it turns out that in this very vanilla version of factor analysis, actually the data likelihood is invariant to orthogonal rotation, scale and label switching. So uh, let's actually talk about each of those really quickly. Um, so when we think about actually, you know, maximizing likelihood to be able to get the values of lambda and x using expectation maximization or something like that, um, we are going to uh, find that actually um, we can describe the likelihood of y um, after we rotate, uh, do orthogonal rotation on each of the lambda and x variables. In other words, if we have 
uh, a, a matrix that will uh, rotate lambda. Um, we can actually rotate X by the opposite direction and we can get the exact same likelihood for Y. Similarly, we can scale all of our X or our lambda by A and then scale each of our A or X by one over A and we can also get the same Y. So that means scale doesn't really matter here. Um, and finally, we can do label switching. So if we shuffle K, uh, each of the columns in Lambda, and we shuffle X column or rows in the exact same way, then we actually also get the exact same likelihood of Y. Um, so this is kind of troublesome because every time you run uh, some kind of uh, factor model, you're going to get completely different lambda, completely different x, and the y axes. You know, thinking about the the values of them really don't mean anything, right? Um, so these invariants basically mean a bunch of things, right? They mean the factors are going to be correlated. They mean the factors are not going to be comparable either within or across different applications, and it might mean it's hard to sort of label the factors in a meaningful way, as we as we sort of referred to before. I'm going to keep talking about that though. So this is hard to do um, because again, it, it feels more like an art than a science. Um, so how do we actually get over these, these challenges and make these methods easier to use across different um, applications? So one thing we can do is add sparsity. Um, this creates both interpretability and also rotational invariance. We're gonna talk a little bit about that later. That's also why um, these non-negative models are, are sometimes really uh, fun to look at because of this parts-based representation uh, that ends up being very interpretable, very sparse. Um, we can also study structure that's invariant to matrix rotations. I'll talk about that then in a second. Um, and we can actually take uh, interesting patterns um, and test these hypotheses using held out data. That's how we can actually uh, uh, think about this information. And I'll give you some examples of that later too. So here's the first idea, right? Which is what happens if we put a lot of sparsity in here? So sparsity basically just means if we look at a, 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 a one of these columns in Lambda, it just means we're adding a lot of zeros. Um, so we can do this in a frequentist way by adding some kind of um, L1 penalty, for example. We can do it in a, a Gaussian way or a <laughs> Gaussian way, sorry, a, a Bayesian way by adding a, a distributional uh, assumption to Lambda prior uh, that, that encourages sparsity. Um, so here we can think about actually um, uh, regularizing in three different ways. We can uh, regularize globally, which basically tries to shrink every element to zero in lambda. It's not too helpful, actually. We can do it factor-wise, which actually just uh, includes or excludes uh, a lot of factors. Uh, it ends up removing a lot of components, but there's no sparsity within the components. Or you can regularize locally, which means literally every single element of this lambda matrix is going to be encouraged to go to zero, but separately. Um, and so local is generally what we do here, uh, just because it actually creates sparsity in lambda. Uh, and then we get these really nice, really interpretable lambda matrices, where when you think about a single column now, uh, a single factor, uh, there's only a handful of genes that sort of explain, make up that factor. So now we can look at that set of sm the small set of genes and interpret things like, what do those genes have in common? Uh, why are they being pulled out here? Uh, what samples are they over or under expressed in? And, and what does that tell us about, uh, about those samples? Uh, so there's a lot going on here that uh, is, is fun to play with uh, in, the, in the results. So what do they really represent? This is getting to the, the interpretation that I really uh, like to have in my mind. So what we're doing in my mind when we do uh, dimension reduction is actually, depending on the dimension reduction, but this is the sort of uh, PCA version of it. Well, actually it's not PCA. This is the factor analysis version of it. Um, so the idea is that we'd really like to understand the covariance matrix of Y. And remember, this is gonna be uh, samples uh, on the columns by genes, the features and the rows. So this covariance matrix of Y is gonna be huge. Uh, if we have a hundred samples, we may have 20,000 genes, and there's no way we can just describe the empirical covariance of, of Y, right? It's just uh, 20,000 genes uh, by 20,000 genes. We, we can't get that from a, um, uh, from a uh, 20,000 by 200, let's say, uh, matrix. It's, it's not possible. I mean, it's, it's, you can do it, but it, it's uh, not gonna be correct <laughs> in, in very many senses. Um, so what we want to do is essentially do dimension reduction on this, right? So when I think about what these factors represent, um, if you actually integrate over the factors themselves, you're left with uh, the loadings, lambda, 
uh, times lambda transpose, right? This is going to be uh, the description of the uh, covariance of the off diagonal elements of y uh, plus um, some sigma, which is actually going to be the diagonal variance uh, terms, okay? Uh, so this is a, an absolutely beautiful result. Uh, and at the end of the day, again, what we're going to, what we think about, what I think about uh, when I think about these loadings is actually they're just a low dimensional representation of the full covariance matrix of Y, a gene by gene covariance matrix of Y. Uh, and if you multiply them together, you're gonna get this really nice, um, uh, usually non-singular, I've done this many, many times and it's basically always worked, non-singular matrix uh, describing uh, the, the covariance of Y, the gene by gene covariance of Y. It's non-singular because A, we have this really low dimensional space here, and B, we also add this uh, diagonal variance term. Uh, all of those things go to make this uh, a non-singular matrix generally in practice. We can add more sparsity. There's nothing preventing us from doing that. So actually Bayesian by clustering is when you add additionally add sparsity to X. Um, so if we do that, now what we're saying is that um, e for each factor, um, there's actually only a handful of samples now that that factor uh, is variable in, right? Um, so uh, actually we did this, uh, one example that we did for this is actually do uh, uh, genes by samples decomposition uh, where uh, we found a factor uh, that only occurred in smokers. Um, and so we were able to say that actually, here's a set of genes that only co-vary uh, in the smokers that we see. There were lung associated genes and presumably it had to do with damage to, to lungs uh, uh, during smoking. Uh, but you can, again, interpret um, these, uh, these factors these, uh, in, in this low dimensional space by looking at what all these samples have in common and comparing uh, you know, those samples, looking at their metadata, their, their demographic data uh, with, um, with, this, with the uh, features uh, that, or the, with the factors themselves, I should say. Um, so this is kind of a cool, uh, a cool application, I think, of these types of models. Um, but even more important, I think, than the cool application is actually this representation. So again, um, this, is, this is the picture I see when I think of dimension reduction. I see Y here, right, which is going to be, again, genes by samples. Um, and what we're doing when we think, when I think about when we do dimension reduction is basically partitioning variation in this space. So in particular, here's a factor, a single factor, where the variability in this set of genes um, non-zero genes. And this set of samples, again, the non-zero samples, um, is going to be explained, the, all the variability in those genes and samples are explained by this particular factor. Not all of it, but some part of it. Um, and then when I look at each of these factors, then I would like to explain what that, or I would like to use that explanation to describe a particular contribution to variance. So maybe this is the smokers, and these are just going to be the genes that are affected uh, differently that co-vary in smokers differently than non-smokers, for example. Um, so now I want to, uh, given this representation, I'd like to, again, put labels on each of these factors saying why uh, only a handful of genes and only a handful of samples appear to co-vary, OK? Um, so when we think broadly about putting these labels um, on the, the, each of the factors, we have to go through a lot of different possibilities. So there's a lot of held out data, a lot of data that did not go to this. Um, uh, so we might think about technical covariates, like the batch um, of each of these samples. Could be library prep, it could be the technician that literally ran the sample. Um, we can also think about biological covariates, so tissue heterogeneity, uh, the makeup of, of different tissues, but it could also be age, sex, BMI, smoking status. Uh, population structure actually contributes a lot of variation to gene expression in particular. Um, so when we think about the ancestry of each of the samples. Uh, and then what I, uh, I love a lot is uh, genomic covariates. So it actually turns out that uh, differences in our genomes actually contribute a lot to variation, it turns out, uh, in, in genes uh, in, the, in the sample, in population sample. Uh, and it's fun to try and identify particular genes or particular, well, genes that are regulated by genomic covariates. Uh, so that's always kind of fun. So again, our job after doing this uh, dementia reduction, partitioning these sources of covariation, is then to give each of them a label, right? To tell, to, to, to be able to describe 
which type of variation uh, the, this, this particular factor represents. Another thing we can do, I think this is my last of, of many uh, different versions of factor analysis, is something called canonical correlation analysis. Um, so this is where we start getting into multimodal data sets, decomposition with, with, with data sets that represent two different types of observations. So here for every sample, we have two things, right? We might have uh, gene expression data and genotype data. We might have uh, gene expression data and imaging data. Uh, we can have a lot of different things uh, in Y1 and Y2. The key is that there's the exact same number of samples uh, along the columns, okay? They can have very different feature numbers too. So P1 and P2 can be very different. There can be 20,000 genes and only 100 or 1,000 features uh, in P2 for images, let's say. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take these uh, uh, two matrices and we're gonna project them down to X. X here is the same feature set, okay? So this is identical matrix uh, in these two different representations, but they're gonna have their own error, right? That error has to do with uh, their sort of modality specific error, and they're gonna have their own weights, okay? So each of these weight matrices, these loadings matrices, are gonna take a different set of uh, features, obviously from Y1 and Y2 respectively, uh, to be able to create this shared latent space X, okay? Whoops. So then when you interpret these models, um, and again, we can throw sparsity on Lambda like we did before, um, then what we can do is let's say we're, we're looking at a particular factor, there's only a handful of features here, and there's only a handful of features in the second data modality here uh, that go to produce that particular factor. So what that means, again, is that these features and these features are going to tend to co-vary. They, they do co-vary uh, in terms of these uh, paired observations, okay? So that gives us a lot to work with in terms of patterns, in terms of thinking about follow-up studies, where now we're interested in quantifying uh, how uh, these, these subset of features in P1 or Y1 and the subset of features in Y2 uh, co-vary, right? So that's the, that's the fun part of uh, canonical correlation analysis. Um, I'll say one more thing, which is um, in all of these uh, methods for dementia reduction, uh, I've shown you a bunch that have to do with Bayesian latent factor models. Um, they're not necessarily the most uh, ubiquitous, um, but the reason I use them is because they're sort of the tool that I know how to work with really well. Um, so I think there's in general a trade-off between expressiveness, um, how, how expressive you can be with your model, and these can be extremely expressive. You can mess around with them in a lot of ways, and computational tractability, where sometimes it's really hard uh, to scale these models to uh, uh, large data sets. Is there a question? You're good, okay. So in general, in my work, uh, we choose models that are expressive um, just because of this big data problem. Uh, you know, if we use, uh, uh, autoencoders and other methods um, for dementia reduction, we are in this sample limited feature rich space, right? The P much greater than N problem, uh, where we don't actually have that much samples, many samples. So uh, when we think about these data hungry methods like deep learning, uh, it's often really, really hard to have enough data uh, to be able to fit these models appropriately. Uh, but since machine learning and statistics in general are developed in these big data contexts, I think it's really up to us as people who think about machine learning specifically for biomedical data sets to reimagine uh, all of these approaches in the context of uh, uh, high dimensional data, not big data, right? High dimensional data where P, the number of features is much greater than N, the number of samples. Um, and it's often true in these contexts that you need really structured models uh, to be able to recover the biological signal that's interesting in those data. Because there's a lot of confounding going on. And unless you sort of pinpoint exactly which signal you want, uh, it's often really hard to be able to see that in the dimension reduction. I'll give some examples of that uh, in a little bit. Um, and then, as we said before, the fitted model has really interesting mechanistic interpretations and the uncertainty is explicit, which is, which is all really nice. Um, in terms of how to achieve computational tractability in these models, there's actually many ways to do it. Um, there's a huge amount of research focused on approximate inference, which we take advantage of heavily in my group when we're actually fitting these models to data. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some work that came out of my group recently. We're gonna, um, I have about 20 minutes left. So um, are there any questions at this point? This has to do with structure in the samples. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, oh, sorry, okay. we do have a question, but our okay. mics aren't working, so let me <laughs> run over. Sorry. Um, do you use any data accommodation techniques in order to enable some machine learning methods? Um, actually, no, not really. So you can do sort of semi-supervised versions of it. And I guess what I'm going to tell you now is sort of a semi-supervised version uh, of a lot of these methods. But um, in general, for everything that I've told you uh, up to this point, no. Um, uh, no data augmentation. Again, every once in a while you can do uh, imputation of missing data and things like that, but um, nothing I've shown you so far uh, requires any of that. Yeah. Cool. Sorry, one more question. Thank you. Uh, I didn't get your comment about like the rotational invariance. Like, uh, like in what sense do we have rotation? I mean, just to have a, a you can have a, a an orthonormal rotation matrix, right? And you hit it, uh, you hit uh, lambda with that, you know, k by k orthonormal rotation matrix, and you then invert that and do it the opposite. Well, actually, you don't need to invert it. You just do it the opposite direction uh, with the uh, x matrix or the sorry, the z matrix, I guess, and um, the the factors, and and then again, it ends up being the identical uh, description. Uh, in terms of the sum over the factors um, for uh, to describe the the data, does that make sense? I could write it. Yeah, out. that makes sense. But why is that a bad thing? Like it seems. Well, it's a bad thing because um, a lot of times we um, we label the factors. Um, if it turns out that those factors are not interesting, if they if you can just rotate the factors, right? Um, so you know the example here of the the spatial coordinates, right? Uh, these factors don't mean anything, right? Uh, the point is that we can easily take the PC1 and PC2 in this setting and, you know, essentially rotate it like a clock. Um, and all of those are going to have the exact same likelihood uh, with the data, it turns out, if, if this is probabilistic principal components. Um, so, so why? Well, you know, again, if you label one as like the north-south um, axis and one is the east-west axis, uh, that all goes out the window in the next run, right? It could be, you know, the likelihood is identical, whether it's, it can be any direction, basically. Okay, yeah. Sense? Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? No? All right, go ahead, Barbara. Okay, great. Okay, uh, so a little bit on structure in the samples, which I think is a really interesting problem in, uh, of course, there's a lawnmower about to start. A really interesting problem in, in biomedical data sets. Um, so we might find, for example, that we have actually case control structure in the samples where some set of samples are cases, uh, let's say uh, they've been treated by something, they have a particular disease, uh, and another set is controls where they haven't been treated or they don't have a disease. As you saw before, we have spatial coordinates where in general we leave those entirely out of the dementia reduction and then we overlay the colors on top of those coordinates, the projected coordinates. We can also think about this with batch or assay or perturbations where we do stuff to a set of cells or they occur in different batches. And then we'd like to look at that structure. Uh, similarly with cell types, um, here's comorbidities, which is essentially sort of, a, I think about it, this is case control. Uh, we can think about it as sex labels. So this is gonna be um, male, males and females where actually in the low dimensional space, it looks like uh, they're very structured there. And also time, which is actually quite similar in terms of uh, spatial coordinates, but it's now across time and not space. Um, so let's sort of be specific about this since we're doing this in terms of machine learning. Um, so case control uh, and sex and comorbidities end up having binary labels, you know, control versus case, uh, males versus females. Um, continuous labels happen in the context of time and space, right? Uh, and then categorical labels happen for batch or perturbation or cell type, where there's not really a relationship between those things. Uh, they're, they're categorical variables. Um, so we kind of want to think about all of these different types of structure when we think about the samples, um, which means we have to basically develop a whole new um, language of, of models uh, to be able to describe each of these, um, uh, each of the structure in the samples. So the first example I'm going to give is case control studies. So here's an example of uh, principal components analysis projection of these high dimensional uh, gene expression samples uh, into a low dimensional space. And you can see 
in no therapy, you see actually quite a lot of structure here. Whereas in therapy, a lot of that structure goes away. It's just kind of one big blob. And we'd like to do a better job of understanding what's going on uh, in these PCs. Um, and the way I think about it, um, this is a sort of general idea behind contrastive models, um, is that we'd like to subtract out all of the variation that we see in the controls, uh, and then look at the variation that we see in the cases without that control variance, variation, okay? So again, here's the, the cases with the therapy, see no structure there. Here's the controls. Um, we do see a lot of structure there, but presumably a lot of that structure is shared. And then when we remove this variation from here, we end up seeing, again, a lot of structure in the, in the cases that we wouldn't have found if we hadn't subtracted, in some sense, the variation uh, from the controls, okay? So uh, very briefly, the contrastive setting looks something like this. We have two matrices now. We have the background information, which is going to be P by M, uh, and we have the foreground information X, which is going to be uh, P by N. And um, this is interesting because they share P, right? They share the number of factors. I'm so sorry about that. Um, if you can't hear me, let me know. Um, they share the number of factors, um, or, or sorry, features, uh, but they might be different non-paired samples in terms, of, uh, in terms of the number of samples. Uh, and again, this is gonna be the controls over here in the background data. They're gonna be generally healthy or whatever control samples. Um, and then these are gonna be the foreground samples or the treatment or the disease samples. Uh, and again, our goal here is to characterize variation that exists only in the foreground and is not uh, shared with the background. Whoops. Okay, so here's a really simple example of this. Um, so here what you're seeing um, is uh, the background samples um, in gray. This is just in two dimensions. And the foreground samples in red. And you can see that the principal component, which is what we've plotted here, is just going to describe, you know, right down the middle, the sort of zero one line um, uh, describing the direction of maximal variation in foreground and background samples. But ultimately, we don't care about that, right? The structure in the foreground samples is very clear when we highlight them, and it's in the exact orthogonal direction. So what we really want is one of these contrastive models where we essentially remove that first direction of variation that's shared with uh, between foreground and background, and what we're left with is the actual structure in the background data, in the foreground data, sorry where we can very clearly distinguish two clusters uh, in there. So, so that's sort of the very <laughs> low dimensional interpretation of, of what we're trying to do. Um, so the way that we do this, or actually I'll say that the way that uh, uh, prior models have done this, there's uh, contrastive mixture models from 2013, uh, contrastive PCA models from 2018, and then more recently, um, or fairly recently also, contrastive latent variable models from 2018 as well. And again, the, the general idea is that there's going to be uh, in the background and the foreground data, there's going to be some shared component, shared component of variation. And then in the foreground data, there's going to be foreground specific um, uh, uh, information as well. And that's all going to be contained within the dimension reduction model. So we developed something called uh, probabilistic contrastive PCA right over here. And I'll say that it, it works, uh, it's sort of a generalization of uh, probabilistic uh, PCA models, uh, which uh, we talked about a little earlier, uh, and these non-probabilistic uh, contrastive models, or sorry, the non-probabilistic contrastive models. An extreme version of this is just principal components analysis, just the, the straight optimization. Um, so the model that we developed looks something like this, where these are, again, the exact same uh, matrix decompositions that you've seen before where X is just going to be decomposed in terms of uh, W and uh, ZX, and Y is going to be decomposed in terms of uh, W and ZY. Um, and here again, this is the background, uh, and this is the foreground, okay? So the crazy part about this is that we actually don't have anything that's specific to the foreground data. What we do is we do this, well, it's contrastive. We're calling it now a relative likelihood. So here, um, we're, we're describing the maximization of our, of our uh, uh, different um, uh, parameters in this model, W and sigma squared, uh, where we maximize the foreground likelihood and we actually minimize the background likelihood. Um, so that means that W will uniquely not be able to describe Y, whereas it will be able to describe all of X that isn't shared with Y, basically, where the variation is not shared with Y. 
it's it's something goofy. It's not a relative likelihood or a likelihood, sorry, it's not a likelihood ratio uh, because likelihood ratios consider the probability of different models with the same data. And it's certainly not a likelihood because we're actually doing minimizing a particular type of likelihood. So we call it a relative or a contrastive likelihood. Um, so uh, as I said, you know, P PCPCA actually uh, generalizes to uh, a probabilistic principal components analysis when we set the scale var variable gamma uh, right here uh, to zero. Uh, so we basically get rid of the denominator. Uh, and when uh, sigma squared goes to zero, uh, then we get these non-probabilistic versions and in the limit uh, here. We get these non-probabilistic versions of these models. And of course, if you do both of them, you just re uh, recapitulate PCA. So we can actually simulate this, or we can do this with this toy problem that I told you about. So here's a probabilistic uh, PCA, where again, we basically get this uh, direction of maximal variance exactly as we, we expected. Um, when we start cranking up our, our gamma variable, uh, we actually do are able to recover uh, this exact um, uh, this exact foreground specific variation uh, in, in this in this version of it. So that was sort of a proof of principle for us that turned out nicely. We can go back now to uh, uh, protein expression, gene expression, however, however, uh, whatever your data say with uh, with this uh, PCPCA. Um, here is. Um, Here's the, the original data set. This is um, with uh, just probabilistic PCA. Um, here's with our, um, our gamma variable set to 0.9. Um, I'll say this is just the foreground data. And what you see here is that opposed to before where the foreground data didn't separate very nicely. Now the foreground data, the, the cases, the ones that have been treated uh, with actually um, electric shocks, uh, actually you see very distinct separation uh, between uh, these two groups. So DS is a particular type of disease that some mice have, the, green, uh, the, the yellow ones, and non-DS are the mice that don't have this disease. Um, and uh, you can see very strong separation uh, in this um, contrastive model. And then if we project the, uh, the, case, or the controls, sorry, with the gray points on here, you see that they're basically a little blob around zero uh, in both dimensions. That basically means that our our uh, factors don't explain variation in those um, uh, in the in the uh, controls very well at all, and that has to do with the likelihood minimization. So one problem with this, and this goes back to what we were talking about before with uh, part space representations and non-negative models, is that biomedical data often are counts. Um, as we know in single cell RNA sequencing, for example, we often just get counts of of the, the number of reads that we identify in each of the cells that map to each of the genes that we have. Um, so this is also a problem, or not a problem. The way data are represented in, in language um, and pixels and other things too. So we can actually expand, extend, extend our um, probabilistic contrastive model to non-Gaussian versions and a, and a non-negative one in particular. Um, so this is not the non-negative version. This is just the, the Poisson, the count version where here our foreground data will be the combination of the shared variation right here and a foreground specific variation. And then background is just gonna be the shared variation. Um, and then actually we can just directly uh, optimize uh, this data. And then we can just look at this uh, foreground specific variation as the, the solution, the contrastive solution here. Um, so we actually applied this to some uh, data from 2016 in PerturbSeq. Um, so the idea behind PerturbSeq is that we have pooled CRISPR screens where we uh, basically put a whole bunch of different um, uh, CRISPR edits into a set of cells. Uh, and then we just do RNA sequencing on those set of cells where we can actually figure out which uh, uh, CRISPR edit was inserted into each cell. Um, and then the foreground here is gonna be the CRISPR treated cells and the background is gonna be the untreated cells. These are our controls. So one thing that we found with this count, um, with this count data, or the and and this count, this Poisson model, is uh, that we can actually really uh, nicely identify co-varying genes in a way that you can't do uh, with simple linear models. So in this case, we have uh, two different genes. Uh, this is LYZ2. This is just the log expression value here on the x-axis. The y-axis is CCL4. This is its log expression. And you can see that in the foreground data, there's a really nice relationship between the two of them. In the background data, there's none. Um, it's just kind of astounding, actually. 
Um, so when we just apply these uh, linear models uh, to them, we see that actually these two genes don't uh, look like they're co-expressed at all um, in the foreground and background data, or just actually just the, the foreground data. But when we uh, use our contrastive Poisson model, we see that these two genes are now two of the top genes actually uh, in this um, in this decomposition, because again, they're they're so strongly covarying only in the foreground data. Another type of structure that we were really interested in is spatial structure. Um, so, uh, really, what this means is now we have you know the a, a, a slice of a sample. Uh, and we can actually look at gene expression values for every single point, which might be a cell, which might be a set of cells in that sample. Um, so here's an example from mouse hippocampus from SlideSeq V2, which is a single cell resolution method. And here's the expression levels of, you know, one of whatever it is, 10,000 10, genes uh, expressed in each of these, uh, at each of these cells uh, in the sample. So you can see a lot of spatial structure coming out here. So uh, I'm going to skip over this because we kind of lack time. I'm just going to show you our spatial dimension reduction. Um, this is called NSF, non-negative uh, spatial factorization. Uh, and the idea here is that um, we have a, um, a fairly standard um, uh, factor analysis model, right? Here are our weights uh, and here are our factors. Um, we're actually technically exponentiating our, our factors here um, as they are just a draw from a Gaussian process. The Gaussian process is what takes the data, which now is not just Y or observations, but it's also X, which is going to be, in this case, a two-dimensional location associated with that, uh, that observation, that, that vector of genes, gene expression levels. Uh, and so what our Gaussian process do, does um, in order to affect the, the features, the factors, sorry, the factors, is basically says if we um, if, if we have two points, xi and xj, uh, that are close to each other in this spatial coordinate system, then we'd like them to, in general, uh, be in the same factor, okay? And then once we do that, we uh, put everything through a Poisson. This is the non-negative part right here. Uh, we put everything through a Poisson, and that's how we generate each of the observations at each of the points, okay? Um, uh, yeah, I'll just say very briefly that this ends up being a part space decomposition. I'll show you what that means. Uh, and we use matern kernels because uh, not everything is as smooth as we want it to in these samples. Um, I'm not going to talk about Gaussian process regression. I will show you what we do here. Um, so here's, our, here's a very simple simulation where this is the ground truth and we can see a lot of different uh, uh, patterns here, spatially uh, coordinated patterns. Um, when we use factor analysis, like we see before, um, we get these uh, really interesting, you know, positive and negative real valued um, factors where there are some kind of combination of each of these sort of fundamental uh, uh, ground truth factors or yeah, patterns. Um, when we use non-negative uh, methods, we actually see really nice separation of each of the four different components that we have here. And in fact, what we end up doing is uh, a non-negative spatial and non-spatial factorization, which ends up cleaning up a lot of the, the disparate noise that we see uh, in this sample. Um, so this is the, this is the non-negative spatial factorization that involves both spatial and non-spatial factors uh, that we end up using uh, in, in, these, um, in the results I'm going to show you. So the first example is, again, the SlideSeq V2 data. These are single cell resolutions. It's a small field of view, but a very high resolution uh, method. Um, these are our uh, factors that we find. We ran it with 10 spatial factors and 10 non-spatial factors. Uh, and I, when I show you where these spatial factors are, these are uh, just absolutely beautiful in terms of what they represent. So two of my favorites here are, are eight, uh, which represents a dentate gyrus granule, gyrus granule layer. Uh, you can just see it really coming out there very, very strongly. And my actual favorite is uh, 10, the meninges, um, which is a very, very thin layer of cells that separates different brain regions uh, in, in this uh, mouse hippocampus sample. And uh, the fact that it sort of fell out here uh, is, was kind of astounding to me, actually. We also looked, because this was a non-negative model, there's a lot of sparsity. We looked at the top genes associated in the, in the weights with each of these factors. And you can see that there are definitely spatial resolution, uh, like here, you can see it very faintly, but it's not anywhere near as good as these, right? It's not nearly as distinct. 
Uh, and that really tells us um, that a lot of these um, uh, brain regions, for example, um, are not necessarily identified with one or a handful of gene markers, where maybe you need a bunch of gene markers to be able to identify them appropriately. Um, we can also look at the non-spatial uh, factors from this model. Here's just two of them, where here we really obviously pull out astrocyte cells, and here we really obviously pull out neurons. But you can see that astrocytes and neurons are in general spread all over the hippocampus, with a few exceptions uh, for astrocytes. Um, these are both non-spatial. You can obviously some, see some spatial structure just based on differences in, in uh, proportions of astrocytes and neurons, but in general, there's no spatial structure here. It's sort of scattered everywhere. Here's a second example that I can just show you. This is a very uh, much uh, higher, um, lower resolution, but higher field of view sample. This is from the mouse anterior sagittal section. And again, we see very, very nice definition uh, of each of the different regions of the brain here. Uh, and as before, also, if we just highlight the top gene for each of these different brain regions, we do see a lot less structure, again, implying that even in this higher, um, uh, higher resolution or lower resolution setting, uh, we do need multiple genes to mark these different gene, uh, these, these different brain regions. Um, I'm not going to talk about this. I think I'm just going to talk about um, how to validate. So this is something that comes up a lot, and a lot of your questions have already asked these, uh, have asked these to, to explain these ideas. Um, but when we do dementia reduction, we need to validate the patterns we find, right? So the way that we do this is by using holdout metadata to sort of label each of the dementia reduction factors. Um, we can use univariate tests for association uh, when we think about like principal components analysis or sorry, anything really where we have sets of genes that uh, appear in the same factor with heavy weights. We can just look at how they're related to each other. Um, we did this with the uh, contrastive, the, the uh, Poisson contrastive model, where you saw a very nice relationship uh, between two genes. Um, that's just a univariate test. We can also look at enrichment among the findings. So if we have a small set of genes that appear in a particular factor, we can do gene set enrichment analyses or look at co-expression uh, uh, to try and understand what it is about those genes that mean that they are sitting in this factor. Are they co-expressed? Are they have similar function? Um, are they uh, a result of damaged lungs from smokers? Uh, so what exactly is it that, that puts these genes together? Um, so at a high level summary, uh, I just wanna say that dimension reduction is generally after processing the data, the first step in the analysis, but it is really hard to do well and, and thought needs to go into it. There's so many methods to choose from. I think, uh, think about what behaviors you want in the dimension reduction methods. Uh, think about how you want to choose the number of latent dimensions. I generally try a whole bunch of them. And what held out data do you want to use to label those dimensions? What, what do you want to explain or what signals do you want to explain in, in the variation of that data? And then finally, how do you explain the patterns that you've identified? How do you actually take those patterns out of the sample you're working with, your sort of data, and think about how to test them out of sample? Uh, to be able to make something of them, to find discoveries and, and, and think about relationships that you couldn't see before. Um, so that's, that's the end. Uh, here are all my uh, students from a couple of years ago and collaborators, and I thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Barbara. Um, I don't know if you could hear the applause or not, but I swear there was. <laughs> um, there is a question on Zoom that I'll mention quickly and then open it up to the room. So uh, Siavash on Zoom asked for the PCPCA, uh, looks really cool. Was there a reason you didn't choose gamma equals one and instead chose gamma as 0.9? He said, it seems like gamma less than one is required to get anything meaningful via optimization. Yeah, it, that's exactly right. So um, uh, it turned out that, I mean, having, having gamma as a tuning variable actually made a big difference in the data in terms of sort of, um, well, let me say it slightly differently. So. Um, here, uh, gamma is, is uh, uh, 0.9, right? Um, so there is a little bit of variation explained, right, in the, uh, in the, in the background data, um, but it's not a lot. If we cranked it up to one, uh, then actually this would be literally just a point at zero, zero, okay? Uh, like none of the background data uh, would be explained at all. 
Um, but this allows there to be a little bit of leakage um, uh, at the expense of um, maybe a little bit of interpretability. So actually, we, we found that this being a, a parameter that you could tune actually um, made a lot of difference for us. And we actually have guidelines in the paper about how to set that gamma parameter. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Any questions in the room? I guess they've all been asked. Shirley? I do have a quick question. Um, I'm just curious the the sparsity so that you yeah. went from PCA to non-negativity. And you know, I do a lot of um, dimensional reduction before interpreting neural networks, right? So yeah. I'm curious if the assumption of non-negativity is actually super important. Or is it can you just replace it with L1? Or is it something that like assuming non-zero made that sparsity so more obvious? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, whoops. Uh, I don't, I don't know if I have an example of that. Um, so the short answer is no. Um, so uh, part space representation and sparse PCA or sparse factor analysis, or really any any type of dimension reduction end up giving you very different examples. So actually, where am I? Where do I want to show you? Um, so Okay, here's a, here's a good example. So Mephisto here actually is a factor analysis with a spatial uh, regularization, a Gaussian process, just like I showed you for our Poisson version, but it's not non-negative. Um, and furthermore, there's a huge amount of sparsity. So this is actually L1 regularized components. So even though you can't see it actually, it only it uses a sparse number of features to describe each of these components, but they still look very, very different uh, than the non-negative versions. Does that make sense? Yes, she's nodding. <laughs> okay, anything else from anyone? No? Okay, I think they're hungry. Um, thank you so much, Barbara. This was incredible. Would you be able to send me your slides and I will pass them around all the students? Absolutely. Awesome. Be mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, thank you all so much. Thank Barbara, you so much, Barbara. <laughs>
car again, adjust the knobs a little bit, then you keep doing this with millions of images. And eventually, if your machine is properly built, it, the, the knobs will settle on a configuration that can classify all the airplanes from all the cars in your training set. And the magic of it is that it will probably work also for images of cars and airplanes it's never seen before. That's called the generalization property. Um, and this works really well if you have lots of data. Um, but you need annotated data that's been annotated by people. So you can do things, for, you can do this for speech recognition, for translation, for recognition, uh, image recognition, or detection of objects in images and things like that. Um, classifying the topics of text, um, you know, things of that type. Um, and mathematically, it's uh, formulated as an optimization problem. <clears throat> so basically, you come up with some sort of cost function that measures the divergence uh, or distance or some, some measure of uh, discrepancy between the output that the machine produces and the output you want. Okay, so X is the input, Y is the output you want. And then um, um, the cost is the distance between the predicted output and the real output. Um, and for a particular training sample that produces a number, and then you average this over your training set that produces a number. Uh, of course, you're going to have a different number for different settings of the parameters inside the inside the machine. That is the uh, this vector w. So w is a long list of numbers that are the position of the knobs. <clears throat> and uh, the way uh, <clears throat> most uh, deep learning systems work is that um, you do stochastic gradient descent, which means you show one sample, <clears throat> figure out in which direction and by how much to change all the all the knobs so that the cost goes down. Okay, so the discrepancy between y and y, y bar goes down. Uh, you make that change, and then you go to the next sample, adjust the knobs again. So the same process that I was uh, talking about earlier, except um, now it's kind of formulated in terms of mathematics. So how do you figure out in which direction and by how much to change all the, all the knobs? What you have to do is compute the gradient of that cost function. So basically, um, think of the cost function as some sort of landscape in the, in the, the landscape of uh, parameter values <clears throat> and what you have to figure out is which direction should you take so that uh, by making a small step the the function goes down by the largest amount okay that's called the steepest descent and that's given to you by computing the the gradient of that function or the negative gradient of that function that's what this this, this direction is so negative gradient is a vector so it's at the bottom here dl over dw it's a vector whose dimension is the same num the same as the number of parameters um, and each component is the partial derivative of the function with respect to each of the dimensions, right? So you move in one direction and uh, you know you can compute by the slope in that direction by how much the function will go down. And then you have that for the second dimension. And if you are in a large space where you have 100, uh, 100 different knobs, then you, need, you have 100 different dimensions. So in each, you have a component um, you know, this gradient has one component for each of the dimensions. So you take a step in the negative direction of the gradient, the eta parameter is kind of a step size. And, and what you get is something similar to the diagram on the top right, where um, you get sort of a noisy estimate of the gradient on the basis of a single sample. Uh, very often uh, for reasons that of the limitation of our hardware, we don't compute the gradient on a single sample, but we compute it on a batch of samples, a mini batch of samples, and then compute the average gradient for that sample, and then take a step. Um, <clears throat> so that's called stochastic gradient optimization. And it works amazingly well, it's very simple. I mean, there's all kinds of tricks to make it fast, but I'm not gonna go into that. So then the next question is, what are we gonna put in that box? This G of X, W, what, what is it gonna be? And that's where uh, neural networks come in. So Essentially, what we want is some parameterized function so that when we adjust the parameters, the function can change from anything to anything. Like we can get it to approximate any function we want. And neural nets are a good way to do this. So what's a neural net? It's basically a bunch of uh, uh, computing elements, uh, units, that we call neurons by analogy with neurons in the brain, but it's a very weak analogy. And what they do is they compute a weighted sum of their inputs. The weights in the weighted sum are the parameters that are adjusted. And then the weighted sum goes into a nonlinear function, uh, generally something that you know has a kink in it, like the, the so-called ReLU. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and that's like a basic neuron, um, a model neuron in a neural net. Uh, so it, 
you can have uh, a bunch of those neurons looking at the inputs and then uh, a second layer and then a third layer, et cetera. There are, there are theorems that show that with just two layers, you can approximate any function you want as close as you want, as long as you have sufficiently many units uh, in the middle layer, in the, the first layer. Uh, but in practice, if you really want to learn complicated functions, you need many layers. Um, so in fact, uh, mathematically, you can represent this a little more abstractly. You can say, well, a deep learning system or an, uh, uh, a neural net, a modern version of a neural net is really just a bunch of functional blocks, okay? That, so each of those boxes here is a, a function that takes an input, a set of parameters, and given input produces an output. The input and the output might be vectors or multidimensional arrays of some kind, let's say vectors uh, for the time being. And to be able to train that system to compute the gradient efficiently, uh, we, so you need to compute the gradient of the overall loss function with respect to all the parameters in the system. And that's done with the so-called backpropagation algorithm, which is nothing more than a practical application of chain rule. So the most complex mathematical concept on which deep learning is based is chain rule, right? It's um, very simple. Uh, of course, it's kind of a, a, a sort of, vector version of uh, multidimensional version of chain world, but, uh, but it's the same thing. So uh, uh, the beauty of the of backprop is, is that it gives you some sort of recursive uh, method to compute all the gradients of the loss function with respect to all the variables in the system in a single pass whose cost is the same as the cost of computing the output from the input. Uh, so you don't have to like, you know, tweak things to figure out like in what direction should I tweak the, the knobs, you can just compute analytically what the gradient is. And so it's based on chain rule. Um, the, the gradient of the loss with respect to the input to module i is going to be equal. So that's a vector, OK, with, whose dimension is the number of inputs to module i, is equal to the gradient of the loss with respect to the outputs of model I, uh, module i, which are the inputs of modules uh, i plus 1, multiplied by the Jacobian, that's a matrix uh, of the uh, all the outputs of module i with respect to all its inputs. Okay, so this matrix here indicates all the partial derivatives of every output of the module with respect to all of its inputs. And if you get the gradient of the loss with respect to the output of the module multiplied by the Jacobian, you get the gradient of the loss with respect to the input. This sounds complicated, but like for very, for things like weighted sums and and nonlinearities. Computing this is very, is very, very simple. Um, what's more in modern uh, deep learning frameworks like PyTorch, which you may, some of you may have used, or TensorFlow or whatever, or JAX, uh, you, you don't actually need to figure out how to do this because you just write your function or, your, or describe the architecture of your, of your network. And the system automatically figures out how to backpropagate gradients to compute the gradient with respect to whatever um, variables you want. Um, so once you have the gradient with respect to all the inputs and the outputs of the uh, of the um, of the modules, you can also um, uh, using an, uh, another uh, Jacobian matrix compute the the gradients uh, with respect to the parameters, uh, and it's the same formula really. Um, uh, so you have a second Jacobian uh, because a function that has two arguments, there's two Jacobians with respect to each of the arguments. Um, so um, very rarely do you have to actually compute those matrices explicitly because the product of a gradient uh, vector by the matrix can be done uh, implicitly. So anyway, so there is like a very useful machinery that does essentially automatic differentiation of complex functions that allows you to minimize a cost function measuring the discrepancy of, you know, between the output you want from your system and the output it produces. That's what deep learning is, nothing more. Now. You can connect uh, very complex uh, uh, block, functional blocks in all kinds of different ways in complex uh, uh, graphs. It doesn't have to be like a neat uh, stack of module. You can connect them in all kinds of ways. Uh, and that's what makes the, the power of deep learning. And it leads to kind of a new way of programming uh, computers where you don't actually write a program. What you write is the architecture of a deep learning system. And then with some data, you fine tune it so that it does the it computes the function you want, okay? That's called differentiable programming. That's what all of those jacks and PyTorch and TensorFlows uh, do. 
Now, one question you might ask again is like exactly how are we going to build those architectures, right, for neural nets? And um, and one particular uh, type of architecture is called convolutional nets, which is one of the things uh, uh, I'm famous for. Um, and it's basically uh, building a, the architecture architecture of a neural net based on inspiration from that of the visual cortex in uh, mammals. Um, so there's some work like going back in the 1960s to the 1960s about like how neurons are connected in the visual cortex and what functions do they perform and things like that. Uh, and there were you know inspirations from from that work to build neural nets even in the 1970s and 80s um, uh, that could recognize images. So one of them is the, the so-called neocognitron model by Fukushima, whose picture is here in the center. Um, and uh, what I did in the late 80s, a few years after Fukushima, was to basically build uh, a network of this type, more or less, but trained with backpropagation, um, backpropagation only kind of surfaced around 1985, 86. Um, <clears throat> so before Fukushima uh, worked on his model. So that's an example of a convolutional net. You have uh, an input um, image, and the, the first layer of units uh, is not connected, like each unit is connected to a local neighborhood on the input. So it only sees a, a little patch of pixels, if you want. And computes a weighted sum of those pixels, uh, pass that through a, uh, a nonlinearity, and that gives you a sort of a activity in the uni units of the, of the first layer. But then one trick in uh, convolutional nets is that the all the units within uh, what's called a feature map, share the same weights. So basically, whenever you have a unit in one part of the image that detects a motif, you're gonna have another one uh, in the other part of the image that detects the same motif because it's gonna have the same weights. Um, so that's called a convolutional layer, and it's very simple to implement. It's a special case of a linear layer. Um, and so, you know, basically multiple units uh, share the same weights. It's called a convolutional layer because the operation performed by that layer is essentially a convolution or multiple convolutions. So, wait, um, so that's depicted on the bottom right, and and I'm sure you've you've heard of uh, some of that stuff. Uh, many of you who has never heard of convolutional nets before, don't be shy. Okay, because maybe it's very boring to you that what I'm telling you. When to NERF's 1989? I'm just curious. NERF's 1989, that was about 400 people. <laughs> wow. <That's it. laughs> okay, now it's like what? This eight, is the NERF's paper. 8,000 now? Um, no, it was, was like 15,000, the meeting we went recently. Okay, but that's virtual, so it's the council. No, no, the, the one is still in person, 2019. Oh, yeah. That's 15,000 right. people. Well, first the first NIPS was 1987. Oh, this was the third. Um, uh, right. So, um, so the first layer is a bunch of, of those units. You know, they look at a, a local patch, um, and all the units in one of those maps share the same weights. And then you have multiple maps, each of which is basically detecting a different motif. Their weights are trained as part of backprop, right? So it's not hardwired. And then there's another type of, uh, of, of operation here called pooling, which basically consists in computing the average or the max of the activities of uh, a little patch of, of units uh, in the first layer. And then, um, you know, that's the output of uh, a unit. And then you kind of take the next window. And if, if the windows are set by more than one pixels, that, that means the resolution of the pooled uh, uh, feature map is lower than the input. And then you repeat the process. You have convolutions again with nonlinearity, pooling, et cetera. That's a convolutional net. So that's an example of convolutional net in action. Um, this is sort of vintage uh, early 90s for recognizing uh, and written digits. Uh, so the input is on the left, and then uh, first layer, second layer, third layer. So convolution, pooling, convolution, pooling, convolution. And then by the time you get to the layer on the on, on, on the right, which precedes the output layer, you get a representation of the input that is very sort of distributed, kind of abstract, but also has a lot of invariance to it. So it doesn't change that much when you do things like translating the number three or distort it, which means that you're gonna have a system that is able to 
recognize shapes independently of distortions and shifts and things like that, which is important for 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 vision, but also for speech and uh, other other things. So that was relatively successful in the 90s, and um, my colleague and I, uh, at the time at Bell Labs, built um, in New Jersey, built um, real character recognition systems that were actually deployed commercially and were reading checks and everything. But the research community lost interest in those models around the mid 90s. Uh, and it took um, you know, almost 20 years for like 15 years for things to become popular again. So our, our friends from University of Toronto uh, in Jeffrey Hinton's group in 2012 implemented a large convolutional net, net on uh, using GPUs, which were uh, becoming usable at the time and um, uh, had been usable for a few years. And they, they built a very large neural net, much bigger than the one, uh, convolutional net, very much bigger than the ones we, we used in the past. Uh, something with, you know, 1 billion uh, weights uh, in the system or connections, I should say. And with this, they, they, they beat the record on the so-called ImageNet competition, which is a competition that computer vision uh, uh, scientists organized to test various techniques for recognizing objects in images. Uh, and the reason, and, and it worked much, much better than whatever it was that people were doing before, so much be better than most of the computer vision uh, community basically abandoned whatever it is that they were doing and sort of switched to using convolutional nets. Um, and it happened extremely quickly. And I'd been sort of preparing the terrain with them with you know some other previous results, but they weren't convinced by mine. Uh, they were much, much better convinced by this one. So as a result, uh, there's been like a huge amount of investment by industry and academia and government, et cetera, in AI research. That's basically what the reason we are hearing about AI so much in the last 10 years is because of this, okay? Um, I mean, there are other successes also in, uh, that preceded this actually in speech recognition and things like that, but really this was the watershed uh, moment. Um, and as a result, um, deep learning has been deployed in, in a lot of different situations now and to the, to the point that um, a lot of, you know, we created a new industry, I'll come back to this, right? So there's a lot of applications, of course, in things like driving assistance. So uh, you, you buy a car in Europe now, pretty much all the cars come with a, a little vision system that looks out the windshield. Uh, it's called the automatic emergency braking system. And if uh, there is an obstacle in front of the car that the driver hasn't seen, the car will brake uh, automatically to avoid a collision. Um, and that reduces collisions by 40%, so it saves lives. And it's pretty much standard now in car, cars in Europe. Uh, a lot of cars in the US also come up of, of those things. The market is dominated by uh, company called Mobileye, which is a subsidiary of Intel, but was a extremely successful Israeli startup. Um, <clears throat> and uh, a huge amount of application in online safety and security. I'll come back to this, uh, environmental monitoring and uh, medicine and things like that. So for medical imaging, I'll come back to this. Uh, but probably the biggest application is in things like uh, content management for online services. So things like, uh, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Google, YouTube, Amazon. They all use deep learning to uh, filter uh, objectionable content and to recommend uh, content that are uh, likely to interest their, their users. In fact, so much so that if you take deep learning out of those companies right now, they crumble. I mean, they're completely built around it in the space of seven years, roughly eight years. So, um, Going forward, uh, deep learning will help us deal with the information deluge by you know, basically selecting pieces of information that are likely to interest us. The problem right now is that it's a little impersonal, it's done by some big company that you know, it, it seems like you're not in control, uh, but eventually you'll have kind of more control over it. Um, and then there's a lot of uh, applications that those companies use for things like translation, transcription, you know, generating um, uh, subtitles in videos so you can watch them silently. Um, and, uh, you know, filtering content, I'll come back to this, uh, very useful for people who have, um, uh, who can't use technology because they can't read, for example, or, um, or because they are, you know, they are illiterate or they're visually impaired. 
Um, so here's a, a short video that shows, it's a kind of an example of what computer vision systems can do today. Uh, this was put together by uh, some of my colleagues at, at Meta. Um, it's called Detectron, Detectron 2, and it's actually open source. You can just download it. So computer vision systems can basically detect and label every object in an image. They can do real-time uh, real pose estimation of uh, human bodies. Uh, this is a thing called dense pose, actually. Uh, and they can do things, um, something we call semantic segmentation, which means labeling every single pixel in the image with the category that, of the object it belongs to or the background surface. Uh, and this is quite reliable. It works kind of quite well. Um, it, it runs really fast on like modern hardware. Um, so if you kind of go back, you know, 10 or 12 years uh, in the past and ask people in computer vision, like, you know, how long will it take for us to be able to do this with computer vision? They'll, they'll tell you like, I don't know, 20, 30 years, um, it happened faster. Um, of course, a lot of applications in science, um, actually this is from one of your papers, surely. <laughs> it's your PNAS paper from a few years ago, which I found really impressive. Um, so a lot of applications in science, in, uh, in neuroscience in particular, um, where, uh, people are using uh, neural nets as a model of how the brain processes information, in particular for visual neuroscience, but also auditory uh, perception, like speech perception, for example, where you, you take a, a convolutional net, <clears throat> which is you know, vaguely inspired by the architecture of the visual cortex, and then using uh, fMRI, functional MRI, you, you try to sort of uh, predict the activity you observe in the fMRI observation from the activation of the units in a convolutional net that's been trained on ImageNet or something. And what you realize is that, you know, the lower layers in the convolutional net correlate very well with the primary visual cortex area where the retina projects. Uh, and then the, the, higher, the higher you go in the levels, the more it correlates with things that are in the higher level uh, areas of the visual cortex. So it seems to be like a good model of the, visual hierarchy in the visual cortex. Uh, there are literally hundreds of papers on this now. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, applications in uh, things like high energy physics for detecting events, uh, filtering trajectories of particles, um, and uh, cosmology, um, and, you know, a lot of applications for like solving partial differential equations uh, approximately but quickly, uh, well, which is one of the you know, one of the big applications. So there are things where you, you want to, I don't know, design the blade of a helicopter or or the foil of a flying sailboat or something like that. You need to be able to figure out the the you know the flow of the fluid on the on the airfoil and figure out the the you know the lift and the drag and all that stuff. And uh, what you can do is train a neural net to predict those quantities from the shape without having to do all the expensive computational fluid dynamics. What you have out of this is a differentiable model that tells you from the shape what the properties will be. So now you can adjust it by gradient descent. You can tweak the shape automatically so that by gradient descent, it will give you exactly the characteristics you want. Um, that's pretty amazing stuff. Um, Similar things for like uh, uh, medical imaging. So this is a project that was a collaboration between NYU uh, radiology department and and FAIR. So by the way, FAIR used to mean Facebook AI research, and now it means fundamental AI research, um, and it's part of Meta Reality Lab. So um, so it's it's called Meta FAIR, maybe. Uh, and and this is uh, the the idea in this project was to, uh, you know can we reduce the time we have to spend in an MRI machine uh, by say a factor of four and still get images of the same quality by relying on deep learning systems to kind of re recover the original image with without loss of quality and it turns out you can do that so now instead of lying down in a claustrophobic noisy machine for forty minutes you can you only need to spend ten minutes. That reduces cost. It you know makes the exam uh, cheaper and everything. Um, so this was a open science project that was done, as I said, in collaboration between NYU and FAIR. And all the data set and and results were published. And now uh, the major manufacturers of MRI machines actually are implementing them in their machines. Um, and you know 
Meta is not making any money out of this. This is all free. Um, not going going into the details, but this is based on some ideas where you you kind of rely on what you know about the physics of the of the process to kind of build the architecture of your deep learning system. And uh, Shirley has been doing stuff like that too. I mean, a lot of people have flat out, I think. Um, uh, it's, you know, a bunch of uh, publications on this that are really interesting. But th there's something that is even more radical, and some people in, uh, at NYU are working on this, uh, is the idea that we don't actually need to generate an image. Like, you know, um, you know, all the man like me goes into a MRI machine to detect uh, prostate cancer, for example. Um, you know, you, you need to generate 2D images for radiologists to kind of make a, a, um, a diagnosis. But in fact, we don't need to generate the images. We could, we could just get the raw data from the machine, feed that directly to a, um, a neural net that would tell you, hey, yeah, this is prostate cancer or no, right? With obviously a very low rate of uh, false negatives, which means, you know, you want the system to uh, basically eliminate all the cases that are obviously not cancer. And then the ones for which there is a doubt, you know, would be sent to a further exam, for example. So it's, it's uh, screening, really. Um, so uh, Sumit Chopra had, at NYU is, is working on this, this idea. Um, but the vision of the, of the future of, um, you know, AI is uh, a world in which, um, so 15 years from now or something, uh, we won't be carrying smartphones in our pocket. Uh, we'll have something like augmented reality glasses, so glasses that can display information superimposed on the real world. On, on, on screens that are, you know, in, uh, in the glasses, uh, have cameras looking everywhere and uh, microphones and basically have a intelligent uh, virtual assistant living in it, if you want. Uh, so I don't know if any of you have seen the 2013 uh, movie, uh, Spark John's movie, Her. It's kind of not a bad de depiction of what could eventually happen with AI systems. Um, in the in the movie, he you know he falls in love with uh, you know his virtual assistant, um, but you know this this movie is stretching a bit, but uh, but it's very likely. So you you know you basically will have uh, a virtual assistant um, that helps you in your daily life, kind of like a human assistant a little bit, uh, a filter, help you sift through the enormous amount of information we're bombarded with every day uh, and et cetera. And, you know, tell you if you're about to cross the street and the car is about to run you over, it will scream at you because uh, it has cameras, so it looks. <laughs> um, and then, you know, if you forgot your keys or your smartphone, it will tell you where it is, where well, you won't have a smartphone. But um, so that's uh, a likely future. And the problem with this, this future is that we need AI systems that basically have human level AI for that. This assistant will need to have something close to human level AI. Uh, we also will want you know, domestic robots that takes care of all the chores in our house. That also requires close to human level AI. At least it, it requires some level of common sense of understanding how the world works that current AI systems don't have. And so the question is, how do we do that? OK, that's the second part. Um, and the first question we might ask is, how is it that humans and animals can learn so quickly? So uh, take uh, any teenager, most teenagers, can learn how to drive a car in about 20 hours of practice, most of the time without causing any accident. Okay. Now, if you take one of the current uh, learning methods um, to train a, a car to drive itself, uh, you only have two choices, self-supervised uh, uh, learning. So supervised learning means you, you have thousands of people drive thousands of cars for thousands of hours, you collect all the data, and then you train a system to basically map a particular scene from the sensors, from the camera, to a particular action on the pedals and the wheels, right? That would be supervised learning. Uh, or reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is that you, you have a car, you let the car drive itself, and when it makes a mistake, it detects that it makes a mistake, it gets punished, and it tries to kind of correct the strategy it used. 
Uh, you cannot do this in the real world. You have to do this in simulation, of course, because that would create tons and tons of accidents, kind of like this car here that runs off a cliff. So reinforcement learning, you would have, you know, uh, the car would have to drive itself for millions of hours, cause, you know, hundreds of thousands of accidents, run off thousands of cliffs before it figures out that running, out, running off a cliff is a bad idea. Um, and then another few thousand before it figures out how to not run off cliffs. Um, and even then, it's not clear it will detect every cliff it's ever, you know, that, that exists. Um, so um, it doesn't work. So obviously, the type of learning, supervised learning or reinforcement learning that we use currently is not sufficient to uh, explain how humans and animals learn uh, skills and learn so quickly. So we go back to, so this is a chart here that indicates roughly at what age. Babies, yeah. But you mentioned earlier how, like, in the 80s, some of the CNNs and stuff were inspired by biology. Um, but the, the models you're talking about now seem like quite mathematical and statistical and quite divorced from, I guess, how, yeah, a human would learn or a baby would learn. Do you think that will be something that comes back, like, in the future? Like, um, this biological inspiration for how like a baby learns. How what we welcome back. I'm, I'm sorry. Can you speak a little louder? Sorry. Um, you mentioned earlier that some of the earlier models were biologically inspired. Yeah. But the more modern methods are quite mathematical. Um, no. No. I mean, not, not more. Right. I mean, you know, you you look at like convolutional nets, for example. Right. It's got this name, convolutional nets, so that sounds like mathematically sophisticated. But in fact, you know, it's inspired by biology directly. Inside of it, you have those ReLU units that are indirectly inspired by biology. You have things like uh, uh, something called layer norm, which is like a normalization of activities you know, among neighboring neurons. You actually observe this in V1. I'm, I'm not saying that people who came up with this idea were directly inspired by neuroscience, but there was some leakage of information <laughs> between neuroscience and, and machine learning. Uh, the more recent stuff, like transformers, where you have uh, basically gating mechanisms where certain connections are activated by act activities of other neurons. Uh, this has been observed in neuroscience for decades. So uh, the, 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 the transfer of information from neuroscience to machine learning is uh, not always direct and not always completely acknowledged by the people who use it because they don't realize where those ideas come from, but they do come from neuroscience. Um, and some ideas also are kind of more, you know, originated by, you know, from either engineering insight or mathematics, but that's rare actually. Um, so, um, right. So what type of learning uh, do babies uh, use? So this chart was put together by a colleague um, at, in Paris called Emmanuel Dupou, who um, is kind of indicating at what age babies learn basic concepts about the world. Um, so they learn things like um, distinguishing animate objects from inanimate objects, or uh, figure, figure, you know, figuring out that when an object is not supported, it, it falls. So the scenario here on the bottom left, if you show this scenario to a six-month-old baby, where you put a little toy on the platform, you push the toy off the platform, and the toy appears to float in the air, which is of course a trick. A six-month baby barely pays attention. Uh, a 10 month old baby goes like the little girl here because in the meantime, she has learned that, you know, unsupported object need to fall and um, this is validating her model of the world. So babies and animals learn models of the world in the first few weeks and months of life. And that this is the type of learning that we should be able to reproduce with machines, which currently we really aren't. Okay, I call this self-supervised learning. I'll come back to this in a, in a second. But a lot is learned by babies. Um, and animals about the world, mostly by observation. It, it, you know, in a few minutes of observation, probably you can learn that uh, every object has a depth because when you when you move your head, the best explanation for how your view of the world changes is the fact that every point in your in your world has a depth, you know, a distance from you. That's the best way to explain how your view of the world changes when you move your head or the difference between the view of your left eye and right eye. Okay, so notion of 3D probably occurs this way. Then the fact that you have this, you know, distinct objects in the world is, you know, probably due to the fact that you have occlusion edges when you move your head, 
Again, objects move differently from the background with parallax motion. So that you know, immediately sort of give you the concept of edges and objects. Uh, and 3D objects, you know, whose appearance changes when you change your, your viewpoint. Uh, and then on top of this, uh, you can imagine building a whole hierarchy of uh, concepts. There are objects that can move by themselves, animate objects, and then objects that just obey simple rules like gravity. Uh, they are predictable. The other ones are, more, are harder to predict. Uh, objects that don't move. Uh, and, and, you know, on top of this, you can, you can build a very complex uh, model of, uh, of the world. Uh, immediately, it tells you that, you know, I cannot just snap a finger and immediately appear 10 meters away. You know that's impossible because every example that you've seen in the world, except in Hollywood movies, tells you that objects move continuously and don't just disappear and reappear. Um, so perhaps the source of, of what we call common sense is, is this ability to learn how the world works by observation. Of course, when babies you know, are a few months old, they start interacting with the world, and that also helps a lot. But, um, but initially, it's mostly just observation. So that leads me to the question of like, what are the next challenges for AI and machine learning? And the, the first uh, challenge is learning those world models, like predictive models of the world. Um, allows us to fill in the blanks and predict what's going to happen um, ahead. And that's very important, as I, I'll say later. So I'm sort of advocating for something called self-supervised learning, which I'll talk about in a second. The second one is uh, learning to reason. So neural nets you know, are basically input-output functions. So they don't reason, really. Although some of the more complex uh, transformer-type networks arguably uh, are capable of some level of reasoning, but there's really no kind of deliberate reasoning of the type that we are used as, as humans and even many animals can do. And, you know, being able to plan complex uh, uh, action sequences. So that led me to this analogy, which is uh, what we can do at the moment is uh, uh, reinforcement learning and supervised learning. And those require, uh, uh, supervised learning at least requires labeled data, labeled by humans. And so the, <clears throat> the amount of data that we can have is limited. And the amount of the number of bits that is provided by the labels uh, given by human annotators is very small. It's a, a few bits per, sam per sample, per training sample. <clears throat> reinforcement learning is worse. Uh, although the reinforcement can be automatically generated by the by machine, the, the amount of information provided for each trial in a reinforcement learning setting is extremely small because you're only telling the machine whether it's good, or, whether its answer was good or bad. You're not telling it what the correct answer is. So if it's a small number of discrete actions like Atari games, that's fine. But if it's uh, like a, a high dimensional continuous space, it's super inefficient. So reinforcement learning requires a ridiculously large amount of trials compared to human learning. But when you can do this, it works really well. You can train a machine to play Go or chess or uh, or various games, and it works. It you know, beat you, you know, to a pulp. So um, so it works really well when it works. Um, but really, most of the learning that humans and animals do is this kind of self-supervised learning thing, which you, you, you train yourself to predict what's going to happen in the, in the world by observation. And in fact, that's arguably, that's probably the main mode of learning that humans and animals uh, perform. That's where most of the information we gather and we train our brains with comes from. And so if you do the analogy of uh, intelligence and learning to... Uh, uh, appetizing cake here, um, the bulk of the cake is this all supervised learning. Uh, supervised learning is really the icing on the cake and reinforcement learning is the cherry on the cake. And the analogy is with the amount of information you get from every sample, okay? Um, and so it's like we are in the same situation as physicists. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong, Shirley. Um, but basically we can do the cherry, we can do the icing but the rest is the, the dark matter of machine learning. So it's kind of like, you know, in physics, you know, we have no idea what dark matter is. And it's like, what, 60% of the mass of the universe? You know, I mean, it's like more than that if you ignore dark energy, right? But um, so it's kind of this, this embarrassing situation where like, you know, most of the stuff that we should be interested in is unknown. Okay, so, okay. So now let me try to, 
make some progress in that direction. So um, let's say we want to build an autonomous intelligent system. So something that behaves a bit like an animal or a person. Uh, it will have to have a number of different uh, modules. And this is my personal view of this. Uh, not everybody in the, in the field will agree with this. Uh, and this is a, a paper that I'm finishing that will probably, will probably come up next, next week if you're interested. There's also a blog post uh, on, Meta, uh, from, on, on Meta that explains this a little bit. But um, so basically the centerpiece of that intelligent uh, autonomous uh, agent would be the world model. So something that enables the system to predict ahead what's going to happen in the world because the world is being the world or, or because of the, of the actions that the agent will take. Um, there is a, the red module here is, uh, is a cost module. So this is basically the entire goal of the agent is to minimize this cost. This cost is a, co a cost function that produces a scalar value. And uh, the scalar value is computed from the state of the world uh, model. And the entire purpose of the machine is to take action so that the state of the world gets into uh, a configuration that has real cost. <clears throat> um, and of course, you need a perception module to get an idea, an estimate of the state of the world uh, beforehand. Um, so there's two ways to use the uh, architecture of this type. The first one is um, what I call mode one by analogy with Daniel Kahneman's uh, system one. So this is basically subconscious action. So you're you know, doing something you do all the time. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to plan ahead. You, you just reactively um, react. Um, so X is an observation of the state of, of the world. You run this to an encoder that produces some representation of the state of the world, S of zero. That goes into some other you know, deep learning neural net thing, um, the actor or the, the policy network really that produces an action in the world and then you know just keep doing this. Um, you can measure the cost of the resulting uh, state uh, periodically. So that's sort of instinctive, reactive, intuitive action that doesn't require any planning. Now, if you need to plan a sequence of actions, things are a little more complicated. That's where you use your world model. So estimate the state of the world, you're using the perception module, and then uh, run a predictor for a bunch of time steps that are going to predict what the state of the world is going to be because the world is evolving or because you take a sequence of action, A0, A1, et cetera. Um, so you imagine a sequence of actions, you run your internal world model to predict what the result of the sequence of action is going to be. Uh, and then you measure the cost of the resulting state, predicted states, okay? And what, what, the, what you can do now, what the actor can do is essentially figure out a sequence of action that minimizes the cost given the prediction that are performed by the model. Okay, this seems, uh, so this is actually very classical in optimal control theory that's called model predictive control. And it's been around since the early 60s uh, with the difference that in uh, optimal control, the model of the world is not learned. It's you know, built by hand, a bunch of equations. Um, whereas here we're going to learn this. Um, um, so the, the cost can have some structure which I'm not gonna talk about. Um, uh, actually, I'm going to say one word about it. So the cost is probably composed of two things. One is a immutable intrinsic cost. So this is something that corresponds to uh, like feelings of like pain and pleasure and hunger and thirst and things like that, right? Um, so you have a piece of your brain called the amygdala that basically uh, lights up when like an immediate uh, thing happens, happens to you, uh, which is either good or bad. And, uh, and it computes your degree of uh, comfort or discomfort, essentially. And that part of your brain is basically immutable. Um, that just determines human nature, right? So it's the thing that drives you to seek the company of other humans. It's the thing that drives you to uh, be uh, dominant or submissive, strangely enough, because we are social animals. We're like, you know, chimpanzees or baboons. Um, it's the thing that when you're a baby that drives you to want to stand up um, so you learn to walk. Um, the thing that drives you to want to have an effect on the world, like to grab stuff and move them. 
Okay, so all of those are intrinsic costs that kind of drive our basic behavior and our, our nature, and they are immutable unless you take drugs, which is very bad for you. Um, and um, and then there is another part uh, called the trainable cost or trainable critic. Uh, and what what the critic does is that it's, it's trained to predict future values of the intrinsic cost. So you know you approach a cliff, and you get a little bit of vertigo or or you know you kind of get scared you don't want to get too close because you know that if you get too close there is a risk of, of falling right so you're you're there is a a cost function that you that you train that tra you know you, you're trained um you train when you were a baby to like not get too close to a cliff um, you probably fell off a, a bunch of small cliffs when you're babies and and that sort of trained this this part of your your cost so it predicts ahead right for example, if I approach Charlie now and I, I pinch her arm, uh, she'll be very surprised. And uh, <laughs> um, I'm not the type to do this, but you know, um, um, and then if the second time I approach, um, she'll probably be, uh, you know, a little afraid and probably will, you know, recoil, right? Or protect herself because, she, you know, she knows, um, she got pinched the, the first time. Um, so that's, you know, the predictive critic kind of predicting ahead what that there is a possibility of uh, pain uh, going forward, right? Um, so it's, us it's, it's useful to have something that predicts ahead whether a situation is going to have a good or bad outcome, essentially. And uh, this is the, the, the seat of uh, emotions, essentially. So if an autonomous AI system has cost functions of this type, it will necessarily have emotions because they're basically anticipation of good or bad outcomes, you know, elation, uh, fear, things like that. Um, so, you know, the idea of, uh, you know, a science fiction idea of coming to data where, you know, there's an emotion chip that you can turn on or off. No, like if you have int autonomous intelligence, you have to have emotions. Yes. No. Yeah, I think the speak is on. Okay. So what I was gonna ask is how do you like sort of try to model the idea of like a choice? Like I get that you can model logical decisions, but there's like a lot of randomness whenever a human makes a choice and naturally it's like based on the past data, whatever experience that person has, but still like two people with the same experience can possibly have like different choices and that would like have a certain degree of randomness. Yeah. But with like a, uh, artificial machine you cannot like allow a large degree of randomness so there are like lots of dangers with it and I think I'm not sure like a lot of like the ideas of like bias in AI or whatever can be like sort of related to it as in uh, like for say credit card companies or whatever if somebody is racist over there then that's like a human's fault but if like uh, an AI model is biased uh, then it, it is the model's fault, but like say a person, if a person was there, they could make a choice to not be racist despite having biases and a model cannot make a choice independently because of some, like, I don't know how would it deal with that randomness. And um, I mean, I don't really understand if we can control whatever harmful effects it okay. could have. Yeah, very good question. Uh, there is uh, like three or four different questions that are completely unrelated in your question. Okay. Yeah. So the first, the first question is, uh, yes, the world is not entirely predictable, and so there are things that you know, in in this. In fact, I, I'm coming to this because that's a very important point in the rest of the talk. Uh, if you observe a state of the world, and you're trying to predict what's going to happen next, there are many plausible things that may happen that are all, you know plausible or possible. And the question is, which one is going to occur? And how do you plan a sequence of action uh, if you don't know what's uh, exactly what's going to happen? So, um, so humans are very good at figuring out uh, that there are uncertainties in predictions in their world model, right? So for example, if I take a, I don't have a pen on me, but it, if I, if I put a pen uh, on the surface here with my finger on it and I let go, you know that the pen will fall, but you can't determine in which direction it's going to fall. 
Okay, so there's some level of description where you can say the pen is going to fall, and we all understand what that means. But the final grain of description, you cannot tell me exactly in which direction it's going to fall. Um, so that's a level of uncertainty. Um, we are absolutely terrible as humans in our ability to predict ahead uh, multiple scenarios when there are lots and lots of different options, right? So you're playing chess. Uh, you can you can play you can make a move, and then your opponent has you know a number of different moves they can make, and the branching factor is whatever it is for chess, um, sixteen or something. Um, then your next move would be another branching factor times the number of uh, possibilities that the opponent just uh, you know could could play, et cetera. There's an exponential growth of the possible combination uh, configurations of boards starting from a particular configuration. Uh, and humans are very, very bad at actually exploring that that tree systematically. Um, and the reason, I mean, we know we're bad because machines are much, much better than us at this. Like, you know, a $20 gadget can beat you at chess. It can beat me at chess. Maybe you're very good, I don't know. But, um, uh, and, and now Go, right? Uh, and other games, poker, all that stuff. So that's the uncertainty. Then the bias is a completely different question, which I'm, yeah. uh, we can talk one-on-one -on -one after the talk, but it's such a vast question that yeah. I don't want to have time to address here. But it's unrelated, frankly. Okay, so how do we train and build a world model? Um, so the problem is that if we have a deterministic uh, prediction in a world model, we get blurry predictions because we don't know what's going to happen among all the possible options. So what you see here uh, in this column here are predictions of a neural net predicting what the cars in a highway are going to do. And what you see is the predictions are like incredibly blurry because the system doesn't know if every each car is going to break or accelerate or change lane. Same here, this is uh, again a neural net trying to predict video frames. And uh, so it's observing four frames and then it's predicting the next two. And the predictions are super blurry because it doesn't know what's going to happen exactly in the world. And so it predicts the average of all the possible outcomes, which is not a good thing to do. Um, so that's where this idea of self supervised learning comes in. So uh, we have a scenario where we observe a few frames in the video, we're trying to predict the next frames. So we observe a piece of an input and, and we're asking a system to predict the rest. And it could be predicting the future, but it also could be predicting other things like, you know, predicting the left from the right or the past from the present or things like that. Um, and, uh, uh, and the best way to approach this is through the concept of energy-based model. So what is an energy-based model? So we cannot just have a function that takes X and predicts Y because there are multiple Y's, so it cannot be a single function, right? So the best way is to represent this to an implicit function. So basically a function that takes X and Y and gives us, um, tells us whether X and Y are compatible or incompatible, okay? Uh, high value of the energy if they are incompatible, low value if it's compatible. If Y is good continuation of, of X in a video clip, then we get low energy, if not high energy. And then that allows, you know, multiple Y's to be compatible with a single X. So um, how do we train this? Um, the problem with training an energy-based model uh, is that uh, we need to shape the energy function that measures the compatibility between X and Y in such a way that it takes low values for training samples and high values for everything else. And there's essentially two classes of methods, one called contrastive method. So contrastive method consists in giving the system training samples and telling him the energy should be low for those training samples, and then generating fake samples called contrastive samples outside of the region of training samples, and then pushing their energy up so that the energy function takes the right shape. Okay, um, so that's the first category. And the problem with contrastive methods is that you need a number of contrastive points to be pushed up that grows exponentially with the dimension of the space. So at some point they're going to be they're, they're impractical. Uh, they're still fairly popular. <laughs> um, You'll see a lot of papers on contrastive methods. Um, what I prefer is things called regularized method. And what the, the idea there is you make the volume of space that can take low energy as small as possible using a regularization function that has some measure of that uh, volume of space. Um, so um, I'm going to go to the 
jump to the to the, skip to the chase. Um, so there's a lot of self-supervised running methods now that uh, I can skip this that uh, work really well in natural language processing. And they're uh, a type, the type of contrastive methods uh, called uh, denoising autoencoders. And basically, the idea is that you take a piece of text and you corrupt it by removing some words, for example, uh, replacing them by a blank marker. And then you run them through a large neural net called the transformer architecture to recover, to predict the words that are missing. Okay. In the process of doing so, the system actually learns a lot about the structure of text. Uh, and, and subsequently, you can use this pre-trained system to uh, the internal representation of text as input to a downstream task like, I don't know, detecting hate speech, doing translation, you know, or things of that type. This works really well for text, for speech recognition. You can, you can train those systems to generate text. Uh, I don't have to go into this. Um, but what's most interesting, I think, is uh, something called... Um, JEPA. Okay, so this is um, this is um, joint embedding predictive architectures, and those are a particular type of architecture for self-supervised running. Where again, you feed an X and a Y, and you're basically telling the system find a representation for X that represents as much as it can about X, and one for Y that represents as much as it can for Y. But at the same time, there is some uh, a predictor network that can predict the representation of Y from that of X. Okay. So the system tries to find a trade-off between representing as much as it can about the world and then ma making that representation predictable uh, in time. So for example, if uh, we are here and I, I shoot a video with a camera panning and uh, X is the first few frame and Y is the next few frames, there's no way that a learning system will uh, you know, learn all the details of the texture of all of your, 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 your hair or the texture of the ground or things like, like you know tiny details like this that are basically very difficult to predict. Uh, if you were in a landscape outside, there could be you know trees with uh, leaves moving and a pond behind with ripples, and there is no way we can predict the details of this. So a lot of information needs to be eliminated that is really not relevant and difficult to predict. Basically, you call it noise, um, and then preserve the part of the information in the world that you can predict. And that is an abstract representation of, of the world. And that's what intelligence is about, really. It's constructing abstract representation that allows you to make predictions. Um, so the method, my favorite method for this is called, um, is called um, VicReg, uh, actually, here. And it's uh, uh, in the 20 seconds I have left. Um, it's a method that basically attempts to measure the amount of information contained in SX and SY and tries to maximize it. And it does this by making sure each component of SX and XY has certain variance, so is not constant. And then by making sure the different components of SX and XY are decorrelated from each other or even independent of each other. Okay, I don't have time to go into the details of how this is done. This, you basically compute the covariance matrix of SX and XY over a batch and you try to make it as close to the identity matrix as possible. Uh, and then simultaneously, you train a predictor to uh, uh, make predictions. And that works really well for things like learning features to recognize objects and things of that type. But uh, I'm not going to bore you with details. So let me uh, conclude. Um, and so by the way, this diagram, which I don't, don't have time to explain, talks about like, how do you plan hierarchically in the presence of uncertainty. So this connects to your, your question. Um, so. Steps toward autonomous AI systems. So the future of AI systems will use self-supervised learning, learning representations of the world, learning predictive models. Um, uh, handling uncertainty in the prediction will be done probably by things like joint embedding predictive architectures, the JEPAs, uh, which are explainable by this energy-based model framework, which uh, you can't explain with probabilistic uh, modeling. Uh, the systems will learn the world models by observation. Uh, they'll be able to reason and plan using this uh, mode two technique I was explaining, uh, probably hierarchically. I didn't have time to explain that. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and then there's a bunch of kind of crazy hypotheses that uh, when, uh, one hypothesis here is that in our brain, in the human brain, we basically have one engine for simulating the world. It's in our prefrontal cortex. And we only have one. 
which means that we can only attend to a single task at a time, a single conscious deliberate task that requires planning. We can only attend to one at a time because we only have one word model engine, predictive engine in our head. We can do a lot of subconscious tasks simultaneously. Like we can drive while we're talking to someone. So the driving has become subconscious. We don't need our world model for that anymore uh, because we need it for talking to the person. Um, and so that would be an explanation for why we can only attend to one task at a, at a time. We only have one world model engine in our head. And it's configurable for the task at hand. So there is a need for this config, mysterious configurator, configurator module at the top that basically sets uh, the entire primes, the entire system for the task at hand. How this is done is not clear to me. Thank you very much. Yeah, I have 31 seconds left. <laughs> good questions about having drinks over at the rooftop. Are with me? So we're going to have the internal receptions and also the reception to this uh, talk at the 12th floor, the basic rooftop of 162. So let's take questions there. Let's thank you, Leanne, again.